Brackets have been busted. Decks have been shattered. Round one is in the books. We move on to round two of the Goliath Gauntlet. Who will break through to the semifinals an inch closer to being crowned the very first Goliath Gauntlet champion? Everybody, welcome back to the Goliath Gauntlet Flesh and Blood Invitational presented by KFAB Cards. I am Mitch Leslie here with Matt Flake DeMarco. Again, diving headfirst into another clutch of our quarterfinals matches. This one promises to be epic. We have national champions fighting it out in this next game. Yeah, we got Michael Hamilton, a pro tour, uh, you know, competitor, uh, you know, US national champion versus Matt Rogers. Somebody who said, well, you know, in his own words, somebody said, ah, I'm all washed up. You know, I got all kinds of other things to do that casually just wins New Zealand's national championship. Why not? Quite the matchup here. Icelander versus mechanologist. That would be Dash. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, really interesting head to head. This kind of matchup we actually saw already between Matt Rogers and Yuki Lee Bender. So we have some understanding of how this is supposed to play out. But the deck lists between Michael Hamilton and Yuki are actually quite distinctly different. Let's jump in and have a look at Michael Hamilton's deck list first. Again, this is one that's really done the rounds a lot. Like it's on Talishar and people are just submitting this straight deck list for themselves in the Goliath Gauntlet. <clears throat> Matt Rogers, uh, excuse me, no, uh, it was Matt Fox rather. So yeah, obviously a very <laughs> popular list to pick up. Matt Rogers is uh, forging his own path. And we'll find that out in just a second. But again, Flake, hallmarks of this list, of course, is, is the Wounded Ball and a lot of these large, tall attacks. Something we've seen used to great effect by many of our Icelander competitors so far. Yeah, it's not very often that players will completely, you know, innovate a hero or a deck or just reimagine what a hero can do. And Michael Hamilton did that for Icelander way back at US Nationals. But however, within that framework of the deck, there are still places that you can, you know, adjust and really tailor the deck to your own liking. A few little, you know, options here or there that you can, you know, tech in or tech out depending, but frankly, the framework is still there. So mentioning about how this deck might be a little bit different than let's say Yuki Lee Bender's deck. Sure, but the, the general framework still exists. The objective of the deck and how it's gonna, you know, cross the finish line is still the same, but you've got a lot of ice cards, a lot of blue cards, and you're basically gonna be off the back of really strong and potent Aether Ice Vein turns in conjunction Function with uh, your, um, sorry, with your Insidious Chills. You know, maybe you get a couple Ice Amulets in there, and then you're always just threatening those big attacks, like you mentioned, Findel's Fighting Spirit, as well as Wounded Bull. Yeah, absolutely. Of course, the strength of Icelander right now is her ability to really play those two turns back to back, right? Play on your own turn and then go for a big play uh, with those Storm Striders. Very, very potent, very hard for opponents to deal with. So keep an eye out for that one. Let's cross and have a look at Matt Rogers' dash list. The only player registering Dash here, of course, uh, a constant love of Matt Rogers'. Uh, not quite uh, the sort of Jacob Bale, uh, Tree Frog esque uh, Dash. That is a true control Dash list. This one here can definitely pivot to that kind of strategy. We saw Matt Rogers start off his game against Yuki with some of these you know, pretty impressive attacks, right? Start to get in there with a bunch of zipper hits, zero to 60s. And then as the game slowed down, he's having to give up more cards. He's starting to pivot more into setting up items like Induction Chamber for that Teclo Plasma Pistol and really started to work Yuki down from there. There's a one of reinforced the line in this list. It's a funny one. Uh, the kind of card that I only really ever saw people desperately try and use against Starvo's ability to fuse consistently, but it could be good at a pinch. I'm not sure if it makes its way into the matchup here though. Yeah, some interesting ways to kind of, you know, circumvent the no D reacts actually, frankly. A Command and Conquer that doesn't allow you to go ahead and, and present a uh, D react for certain cases. I mean, here's another, it's an instant to buff up an attack action that's blocking a card. So that's always available for you in case if you want to just go over the top, we're not going to probably see that much in, in this matchup, but you never know. Again, there's the, the attacks go tall, but they don't have necessarily the on hit uh, effects that might scare you. But ultimately, yeah, this is a list here with Teclo Pounder and the Induction Chamber slash Plasma Purifier package that you can kind of pivot depending on the the, the matchup that you have, do you want to get aggressive or do you want to slow it down? And I suspect in this matchup, we're going to be slowing it down. Yeah, no doubt about it. I feel like both these decks are capable of that kind of game plan. So let's jump in now to our third quarter final. It's going to be Michael Hamilton going up against Matt Rogers.
want to point out that even if Icelander starts at 36 life, Michael Hamilton has a veritable trove of cards that give him extra life in the finals fighting spirit particularly. So while it says 36, those plus the height of final can basically make it uh, an even match if Michael Hamilton's able to get value out of those. I know you're absolutely correct here. 36, that can easily just, you know, start the game off with uh, going up to 37, 38. You still have the heart of Findel as well that you can pitch away to gain a life and perhaps see it on a second cycle as well. So a lot of cards in the deck are representing Michael Hamilton at a higher life total, closer to like 40 or 42 even. Uh, so that kind of evens things out. Just kind of the extra extra sauce you get from cards like Findel's Fighting Spirit. And, and you know, th those are in there to kind of equalize the detriment of playing Wizard, which is the lower life total, frankly. Matt Rogers is starting off his turn here with uh, a counter on the induction chamber, a counter on the pistol, and then coming in with that red throttle. Uh, he goes second as Hamilton simply uh, pocketed a card and passed the turn over to make sure, of course, he's got some action here. But throttle, it, it ain't nothing to sneer at. Six coming across here with the boost. Yeah, six with the boost. And these lists, these mechanologist lists that run the boost, usually you want to avoid those landmines that are floating around your deck, uh, cards that are not mechanologist based. And in terms of Matt Rogers' deck, three sink belows, reinforce the line, uh, Toma Fiendall, unmovable, of course. And unmovable against Michael Hamilton's list is going to get some work done because it can potentially block up to eight. And there's a lot of the, that, that, you know, that wounded bull is essentially a perfect match for unmovable, but no guarantees on the boost. But the odds are certainly in your favor, Matt Rogers. Yeah, of course. Boosting uh, is banishing the top card of your deck when you play a boost card. And if it's a Mechanologist card, the attack you've just played gets go again. Matt, based on the border of the card and his banish there, got the boost here easily enough. So Brothers in Arms going to be thrown out here to block. And it looks like that that's extra function of the card also going to be tapped into. Looks like Hamilton's paying one to give it an extra two block, blocking for four. Wonderful utility card here with Brothers in Arms. It pitches for blue, which is what Icelander loves. It also can attack if necessary, but let's be real here. If you can just bump, uh, pump that up to a four block, you're getting work done. The pistol's going to follow that up. Bring Michael Hamilton down to 32. So two leaks through off the boost. The pistol seems rather, you know, rather unassuming early on, but we're going to count just how much work that pistol does by the end of this long, grindy game. Yeah, Rogers gave it go again with that counter off the induction chamber. So there's definitely another pistol attack to come. And he has one left over to put a counter back on the induction chamber. This precipitates the move from Michael Hamilton. He says, all right, here comes his ice bolt inflicting you with a frostbite. So if you actually want to want to shoot at me, it's going to cost you. It's going to happen. He's just going to let it fall on the board here again, taking some of the damage. Matt Rogers is in a good position already, you know, connecting for some damage. A frostbite here on... Keep in mind, I believe this is all happening. Uh, is this happening on Matt Rogers' this is, this turn? This is still Rogers' turn, yeah. He's about to attack with the pistol. The, I, the, the frostbite means that Matt can't freely attack with the pistol. So essentially, his turn has to end if he wants to arsenal. Yeah, and this is the timing of Icelander and dropping those ice cards. Again, this the significance of being able to just sneak it in at the last second, at the 11th hour there, which really just kind of completely changes all your plans matt rogers is essentially he's got dinner plans at seven awesome the, G, the gps says he's 20 minutes away he gets in his car at 6 40 and suddenly he hits a string of red lights and he's got to change things up that's basically what michael hamilton wants to do he wants to create the the all of those little extra obstacles that makes it so that matt rogers can't squeak out uh on those you know perfectly tuned and timed resource to attack ratios yeah, so Roger's trying to present as much damage as he can with the resources available to him with the caveat that a lot of what he does will get taxed. He does open up here with a one for five attack from zipper hit pitching, a yellow zipper hit, and the boost is good. So go again is currently live. Michael Hamilton says, I'm going to take this damage. Okay. He's taking some huge hits here. I wonder, Flake, if he's hoping to fuse uh, something here, either on his turn or, or now. We're going to have the Tecla Foundry Heart uh, used here for Rogers to, again, find a net gain in resources and yeah he pays one gets two so my suspect uh, my suspicion here is potentially that i mean there's going to be other attacks that are going to be coming through uh off the off the boost um michael hamilton here assuming it's something like let's say an aether ice vein um you got to pitch the blue you got to fuse it 
And then you got to potentially pitch on top to get the waning moon through. So it's at least a three to maybe four card play. And at this juncture, what he's probably assuming here is, okay, an Aether Ice Vein fused plus the waning moon Ooh. is already above rate from what you're presenting. And I, I value my card and disruption of your game plan versus anything else. And keep in mind, there's still a arsenal that's still uh, that's left there. But uh, four off the top here is uh, what's following up that initial zipper hit. Yeah, crucially, High Speed Impact says if it hits... The next attack that Matt Rogers boosts will gain Dominate. So that is online now, as it looks like Hamilton takes the one damage, blocking with an Ice Eternal here. Rogers says, right, well, do I have any boosts? Or perhaps I'm going to start now chipping in with this Techloplasma Pistol. It's the first attack from that this turn, coming in for two. Go again. Why not? Let's go ahead and just pile on here. We're seeing... The, a bit of the game plan that Matt Rogers is uh, effectuating here as well is to get the boost in wherever necessary. And when Michael Hamilton is giving him the free lane here, we're going to also tickle you with that Techloplasma pistol. The purifier is allowing you to go, or sorry, the induction chamber is allowing you to fire it multiple times. There's no purifier on the board to give it a little extra punch. But what's important here is just making sure that all of those counters just kind of get slid around like musical chairs. This goes here, you sit there, I go here, and eventually at the end of the day, that, that pistol has went bang, bang a few times. Well, there's a lot of traffic lights, like you said, for Matt Rogers. A lot of red lights as he's trying to get home. But if he gets 0 to 60 quickly enough between them, he might just make it. This is 0 for 4 here with a boost. And that is good. This now will force Hamilton's hand. It's going to be a Frost Hex from Arsenal afflicting Matt Rogers now. Every time a Frostbite expires under his control, he will take damage. But it's not a block here from Hamilton. So he's taking all four of this to the face. And all of a sudden, 16 of Icelanders' life has gone down the gurgler. The gurgler is uh, that's um, that's incredible. I, I, that actually sounds kind of like um, a failed horror movie villain. You know, you got Jason Voorhees, you've got uh, Freddy, and you've got the gurgler. I'm not oh, even. Yeah, they forgot about the gurgler. <laughs> that's 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 precisely what is actually printed on the movie poster. It says they mm. forgot about the gurgler. When yeah, I hear I mean, the gurgler, got, forgot about Dre, but yeah, forget about <laughs> the gurgler as well. You're gonna have a bad time. Yeah, that oh uh, yeah, exactly. 90s rap stars that also didn't make it. The gurgler. Um <laughs> Okay, we're back on the rails we go, Uber. Here we are. <laughs> uh so I like it again, the perfect timing for Michael Hamilton again to just go ahead and not only sort of stop whatever follow-up could have uh, you know uh come at, after the frostbite that comes through here but also I believe the frostbite in relation to the frost text also tickled Matt with a little bit of arcane yep. damage. Yeah, he took one from that. Uh so some damage getting returned here. This is a pedal to the metal to block. Just a blue there is scar for a scar. You're held in Hamilton's hand as looks like he uh, is going to be out of pocket and draw up at the end of the turn. So be out of return for damage here. Matt disinclined, obviously, to give cards up because he knows he's going to get taxed now. It comes back to his turn. The first order of day is to put a counter back on that induction chamber. And again, M M Rogers might look to prod Hamilton a little bit here. I... I Feel like it's better, yeah, to go for a big attack first before Hamilton can really do much. But he had a window to respond. Michael did to slow Rogers's turn up uh, when he put that counter on the induction chamber. But it's gonna be a throttle for six again. Nice red attacks here, big numbers. Hamilton definitely has to give this due consideration. Certainly, but we know how this works. Typically, the Icelander player is not necessarily going to get much of the work done early. It's a it's a slow grind type of approach, and being able to just go ahead and establish cards like uh, Frost Tex being able to absorb some of the attacks that are coming through. And frankly, Matt hasn't necessarily, you know, he has been kind of laying it on thick. He has been actually punching through for damage, but you know, we haven't really seen some of those massive turns because Michael has been very adept at freezing out the rest, sort of the, the bookend of what Matt Rogers plan is. And Michael Hamilton here, again, doing the same thing by mm. revealing the ice amulet out of the arsenal, creating a frostbite token six still is what he has to account for here. That's what's on the stack in terms of getting the damage punched through, but a frostbite on Matt Rogers side, one card in hand, and a waning moon is uh, what the, the punch back here from Michael Hamilton is going to be. Curious to see if Matt cares much about this damage. He obviously has pretty natural AB2 between the Visiotronic Model I headpiece and, of course, the Achilles Accelerator boots. Not many heroes have their preferred boots in all matchups uh, coming with Arcane Barriers. So Dash uh, doesn't have to sacrifice too much efficiency in terms of her items to uh, still be able to inoculate herself against potential Arcane damage. Looks like Matt's thinking about this. Michael Hamilton deploys from his arsenal the Amulet of Ice. So that is a setup card. Um, 
you know, more to do with fusing than it is with creating frostbites. But hey, uh, there's a con, there's a confluence of both those abilities in cards like Ice Eternal. So worth keeping an eye on. Rogers has that extra blue in his hand. So he says, well, I think I'm happy to pitch this here to, to not take any damage from the Waning Moon. Try and keep a high life total. Um, now I threaten an attack for Michael Hamilton that drops him below half of his starting life. Yeah, he's getting the work in there. Slowly but surely. Uh, it, it always seems I, I was uh, at the Realm Gaming um, Fall Brawl and I, I managed to play in the team event and I played against an Icelander as Dromai. And it seemed like every single time I played a card, I, play, I would play my turn. And then if there was this sort of five minute, you know, powwow session of what the hell can we do to do things. So uh, that's kind of how this is, is Matt Rogers is presenting a card and then just waiting for Michael Hamilton and the hamster wheel in his mind to sort of just churn out these turns. As you can see over here, like, look what's going on. I, I, there has been the, the frost hex, uh, sorry, yeah. the, uh, the ice amulet, the waning moon, the frost, uh, the frostbite tokens times two, apparently, as well as just blocking stuff out. So Matt Rogers turns are never what they they seem to be at the beginning. Yep. Matt Rogers might have a plan, but it just gets gummed up by all this frostbite and Michael Hamilton, um, you know, just mucking it up. Yeah, so extra frostbite for Michael Hamilton because he plays a blizzard there. Icelander says, you get a frostbite token under your opponent's control whenever you play an ice card during your opponent's turn. And blizzard's an instant. So not only does blizzard say to Matt Rogers, you are going to lose your go again on this attack unless you pay two. But also, here's another Frostbite. So even once you pay two, now you have to pay an extra two more because of these Frostbites to make your ne next action. Virtually ends his turn and puts the Brothers in Arms in as well in front to block. Pretty efficient blocking. And he's still able to Arsenal a card. That is pretty nice defense here from Michael Hamilton. He does go down to 18, but he stopped Rogers in his tracks in a big way there. And here comes in the good old T-Bone. That's right, T-Bone coming through. And again, it's not necessarily a detrimental card in many uh, facets when it's just presented by itself. But if you can chain together a few of them, you can go ahead and yoink some of that very important equipment. Like, obviously, if you can go ahead and score something like the Tunic or even the Coronet Peak, that's awesome for you. But in this juncture, you know, the you're, you're, all, you, all Michael has to do is just say, okay, have my Storm Striders. They, yeah. They're not going to break. You can have them. It's just basically kind of looking at them. It's like you can look, but you can't touch in this case. But again, damage being dealt is what's important here. Matt Rogers needs to get the work done before those insidious chills just pile up. And eventually, when you're staring down the that those those auras that are on the board, those afflictions that you know one Aether Ice Vein is going to ruin your day and potentially just buy Michael Hamilton tempo and multiple turns in a row. I mean, you're exactly right, Flake. Rogers knows he's on a timer here and needs to figure out a way to put Hamilton in a position where he has to overblock and start to give away too many. And yeah, T-Bone's great, but T-Bone in and of itself doesn't damage equipment. It wants to pull in equipment that has on the card. If you block with this, it takes a battle wand counter or has blade break, right? Because Storm Striders doesn't have any durability, doesn't have Blade Break or Battle Worn or Temper, nothing happens to it when it blocks. So it gets scary when there are multiple T-Bones on the combat chain. You can't just put the same bit boots in front of it because they're stuck on the chain. You have to start actually putting some of these more susceptible equipment. Uh, like I got triple T-Boned once and had to give up my Courage of Blade Hold um, in a, a Blitz tournament as a, a Kasai player, which is really frustrating. So um, Rogers there was just looking for the, the three damage. Didn't expect anything more from that. And here comes in the, the Teclaplasma pistol now. Bear in mind, Hamilton's arsenal still ready and waiting to be deployed. Oh, yeah. We've seen when, when he likes to pull the trigger on that arsenal. It's usually at the sort of when uh, when Rogers has one card left in hand to the, to the point where he's basically uh, presenting a scenario where it's, okay, you can play the card. But you're you're essentially forfeiting an arsenal uh, down the line, and I don't think Matt Rogers likes to give that up. He's kind of been playing the patient game. I think what Matt Rogers wants to do is just wait until those there's those wonderful opportunities where maybe you get a, a chance to go and hit that maximum velocity. Maximum velocity again, a incredibly potent card, one of the strongest uh, natural attacks in the game. The criteria for it, however, is that you have to boost three times. And against an ice hero, that can be incredibly detrimental. I think what Michael Hamilton might be holding on to there, maybe it's something like a Channel Lake Frigid. Maybe when he's feeling threatened enough that he's he's maybe anticipating something detrimental or, or devastating like maximum velocity, he'll go ahead and hammer out those, uh, those you know, the Channel Lake Frigid to really stop that maximum velocity turn. But again, Michael Hamilton knows what the hell he's doing. He has been immaculate in terms of when to play that arsenal card to really get exceptional value from it so he gets his attack and he's able to put a counter 
back on the pistol here because the induction chamber is allowed to have a go again. So he can fire that pistol again. Hamilton still hasn't really been put in a position where he's felt like he has to block. He still has his iron, uh, iron hide gauntlet there as well if he needs to put that in front. He is sitting on a tunic counter, which is always really scary going into an Icelander player. Uh, there's a lot that Hamilton can do here. Even like a cold snap from Arsenal still means that Hamilton could do something kind of nice on his turn because that card replaces itself. That has the extra effect, of course, uh, of being able to, to freeze, uh, to freeze your opponent's arsenal, which is really annoying. Matt doesn't want to pay for these little things. He doesn't want to pay extra because of Frostbite. He doesn't want to pay extra to keep his arsenal unfrozen because he does a lot of little things. He loads his pistol. He puts a can on the induction chamber. If those actions, those moves start to get more expensive, all of a sudden he's run out of things to pitch for, even with things uh, like Teclo Foundry Heart, even if he has gets a Teclo Core, like... Dash is great at generating a lot of extra resources for herself via equipment and such like that. But Matt's going to end the turn here. So this okay, he's deploying an item here, the Plasma Purifier, which is going to buff his pistol shots if it has counters on it. This, uh, this, this item card doesn't have go again. So playing an item card will normally end your turn unless it's from Spark of Genius. It might be a situation where he's saying, "All right, I'm 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 happy to do this." Okay, because there is uh, uh on this is on Michael's turn. However, it is a a red Aether Ice Vein, and it's going to get fused. So five damage is going to be punching through. And I'm wondering if Michael is going to choose to use the Amulet of Ice to go ahead and peel more cards away from Matt Rogers here. But for now, it's five Arcane. It is met. It is uh, fused with a Frosting, and uh, so five Arcane is going to go through. It's going to cost Matt Rogers also two resource or a card from hand if it connects and it looks like all the uh everything's in you know there's not enough ab to absorb this no. it is one of the most powerful cards that michael hamilton has against it so matt rogers opting in this case to say I, there's no point in absorbing a little bit of it we take it all and we pay the tax yeah ordinarily uh the sort of most efficient way to deal with that is to pitch a blue uh try and block one of the Aether Ice Vein damage and then pay the extra two uh, that is floating. Okay? So you're only losing one card. That's about as good as it can get. But um, of course, because a non-attack action has been played this turn by Hamilton, he can also follow up with a cheeky little Waning Moon for two. So slowly and just, you know, trying to equalize, Michael Hamilton started the game at a deficit at 36 to 40. Matt Rogers down to 23 now. Matt Rogers did put in work. 20 damage has already been punched through against Michael Hamilton. You didn't make a good point there, Uber, that there's about four to six life gain in the deck, um, you know, through things like Fyndel's Fighting Spirit, Heart of Fyndel, obviously, can be pitched multiple times if we get around the, around the horn a few times. But uh, Michael Hamilton has proven that this deck does not necessarily care about its own life total too much right away. It's more so about the grind and the the proper timing of cards. Matt Rogers playing um, a, a deck that can, you know, go wide and get really aggressive. But ultimately, when you're presenting the induction chamber at the beginning, you know that it's going to be a longer game and getting value out of the pistol is what's going to be important. Yeah, and remember, the Purifier, um, you know, can buff the pistol by one for the whole turn. So it's that four damage from two pistol shots now turning into six. It can be relevant. The problem is, is like, you know, you kind of hinted at Channel 8 Frigid. If that comes down, like then putting putting steam counters on stuff becomes prohibitively expensive for, for Matt Rogers. It's just, uh, you know, not really viable. Spark of Genius here now, just to be clear, uh, obviously you can't go again after this, but it does allow you to pull uh, an equipment, uh, an item card rather out of your deck. Spark of Genius says, Search your deck for Mechanologist item card with cost X, put it into the arena, then shuffle your deck. If you've boosted, you can draw a card. But uh, again, pretty nasty play on, on turn zero, this one here. And uh, will allow Matt Rogers to go digging for another item to start to really supercharge uh, his turns. Have you read some of the flavor text on these Mechanologist cards? It might be one of my favorite. Like, look at something like Zipper Hit. And I want you to read me Zipper Hit much like it would be a salty log. Oh, <laughs> uh, okay. Yes, yes, off you go, my tiny zipper wings. Take your gases to the masses. Signed Maxwell. <laughs> Who yeah. the hell is Maxwell? That's the other no, thing. No, no. Um, no. The other one, which I think is, is pretty awesome, is Maximum Velocity, where it kind of, the flavor text reads like an advertisement, like something that you'd, you'd have before watching a, a YouTube video. <laughs> Just, I mean, it is actually, yeah, it's, it's, it's unbelievably flavorful. Uh, yeah, well, that, it's, it starts off with like a 60s Batman thing where it's like, zoom, zip, kazam. Ever wanted to show old Joey what for? 
Now you can with the Velocitator 60T. Turn that pesky rival into a smear on the pavement. Wow, that was written in the 80s. Yeah, love it though. Uh, Who the hell really is on Joey theme. and Maxwell? Like, it Dunno. sounds like a full house reboot. Anyways. Uh, we got Data Doll instead of Maxwell. I don't know. I mean, I'm sure some people are happy about that, but I'm just. There's saying. a channel like Frigid Uber. That is uh, one of those big detrimental cards. And perhaps this is because there's a Tequa core on the board and we're just kind of protecting a few things here. Ultimately, though, uh, you know, Michael Hamilton is going to. Oh, it was. Was that. Okay. So that was fused, was fused. on top of the Ice Eternal. Yeah. That's really scary. This happens on Michael Hamilton's turn. Uh, he's able to deploy it. And again, he creates three Frostbite tokens and then. Uh, Ice Eternal was fused, so it will deal three damage. This is awful now for Matt Rogers' turn, coming into his turn, because these Frostbites obviously don't go away until the end of Matt's turn. So he has to start his turn with these. And Hamilton just flashed a Channel Lake Frigid from his hand there. Uh, that is also absolutely terrifying stuff. I believe um, it was, I think it was pitched away, however. Oh, no, that, oh, that okay. was that was the fusion. It might have been, that was, that was the fusion. So he does still have it uh, floating oh, about this. Oh, God. Oh, goodness me. My, okay. So. This is it on is Rogers' turn. Correct. Four Frostbites and a Channel Lake Frigid. I mean, you have to try and pay through these somehow. Those you can take four damage just from the Frost Text being in play. And of course, the Channel Lake Frigid taxing every single thing Rogers wants to do. Do you want to put a steam counter on something? Want to attack with your pistol? Cough it up. Absolutely. Just, uh, you know, choking out Matt Rogers at the end of this turn here. This is taxation with representation from michael hamilton saying yeah that's cool uh, i am from the u.s and i'm sending you a bill all the way out to new zealand my friend and you gotta you gotta pay this up as like again those four frostbites represent uh, basically nothing for matt rogers matt rogers did have some floating here and he's likely gonna have to pay through this in order to actually kind you know like if it, it, paying through these this five extra tax means that you are not just busting up those frost bites, but like you said, frost text is on the board. It's also going to, you know, save you for life. So there's a lot of incentive for Matt Rogers here to clean out the ice to just defrost his side of the board, and in, in order to just keep himself, um, you know, uh, his life total a little bit healthy. Because again, we have seen so many matches where the the player playing against Icelander with with Storm Strider still out can get themselves into a position where they just get gooned by Storm Striders and it's over. Matt Rogers needs to be in double-digit life total to still have a chance in this matchup. Well, this is a payload. So coming in for six, and if you boost it against Dominate, Matt Rogers paid a casual seven to play this card. Two coming off the Teclo core, and then he pitched a yellow and a blue because of just the, the amount of taxation that is occurring to him right now. So good to still be able to present an attack like this. Paying seven resources to do six damage is rough, but it will save Matt Rogers from having to take four damage from the Frost Hex and those Frost Bites at the end of his turn. It's rough stuff to be sure, but being able to fight through it is a real key component of sort of staying alive under the, this avalanche that Hamilton is dumping on Rogers' head. Yeah, yeah, six for seven does not seem like the ideal thing that you want to put into your deck. Unfortunately, Michael Hamilton just presenting a situation where, hey, you know, we're, we're going cross borders here. There's going to be an import tax on everything that you're sending my way. And uh, it is cash on delivery. So pay up, like you mentioned, cough it up, says Uber. And in this case, he did. And wisely so. Those four frostbites on Michael Hamilton's side of the board, I believe those are wiped out, if I'm not mistaken, because they were paid out, like you mentioned. Uh, but Waning Moon is, again, just slowly eroding away Matt Rogers' life totals as Michael Hamilton is also dancing close to the edge as well. Yeah, Rogers eats one from that. He pitched a yellow to Arcane Barrier when Waning Moon came in. 10 life can be very scary for Icelander. But again, Michael Hamilton now can start to turn up the heat a little bit more. And yeah, on his turn, he's going to deploy an insidious chill here. So more ways to tear cards out of Rogers' hand, make it harder for him to have a turn, and also make it harder for him to pitch to Arcane Barrier when that Alpha Strike starts to come in from Hamilton. Flow counter on Channel Lake Frigid. So Hamilton's definitely incentivized to do something on his turn because he needs an ice card in pitch to keep the Channel Lake Frigid up. Now pass back over to Matt Rogers. He'll gain those last two resources from Teclo Core. He's not staring down the barrel of four Frostbites at the least, but he has to fear what might be in Hamilton's group. Seven life difference, but this game far closer than that might indicate. Absolutely. It gets really gritty towards the end as both players are just kind of chipping and clawing away. You know that Michael Hamilton is kind of just 
packing that powder keg and and it's going to explode at a certain point where you're going to hit one of those other aether ice veins you might fuse it uh you're going to pair that up with insidious chill you're going to peel away so many cards from matt rogers hand and perhaps if you've got you know you you draw up to some nastiness and then it becomes a game of all right storm striders is just going to bust you up matt rogers has to be very protective of this life total um he knows that there's nothing he can necessarily do against an insidious chill turn but what he can do perhaps is just present you know enough uncomfortable damage while maintaining cards in hand so that when michael hamilton does decide to swing back with arcane he will be able to pitch to absorb some of it matt rogers i feel right now needs to be cracking that goliath gauntlet i think that if he ends this game with that goliath gauntlet still on board that's a missed opportunity hey you can't destroy our mascot in front of us without <laughs> without any sort of outrage good lord i mean you might be right i also wonder like I wonder if there was like a, a point in bringing Teclo Pounder in here, if Matt was feeling like he was only going to make one attack a turn uh, instead of the Purifier, which gets really costly when you're trying to put Steam Counters back on it. Maybe the Teclo Pounder, given that plus two to boost the attacks, might have been nice, but that's by the buyers. Hamilton blocks here with the Finals Fighting Spirit. It's two block on print, but gains you a life uh, when but you block with it, of course, uh, with the caveat that you have less life. So still some decent damage here taken by Hamilton, though. Big hit, down to seven. The story here is the fact that he just flashed out a uh, a hypothermia, which is an absolutely killer card against mechanologist that wants to boost and gain go again. Again, hypothermia is an ice affliction that is going to it's a blue ice played at instant speed, giving your opponent a frostbite, but also saying your tanks you control do not gain go again. And that's what boost does. Boost that's gives it. these cards go again. And that's it. You're essentially Michael Hamilton is timing these cards so well to say, all right, before that resolves, suck on this. And that's the end of your turn. So eat all those cards you just had in your hand and you're going to get a frostbite and things are going to suck for you. That is terrible for Rogers having to draw up a two cards already in his hand. Comes back to Michael Hamilton. He says, how about this one, chief? Bull comes in horns first. Uh, Going to be hitting for a solid little bit of eight damage. Here come those red attack actions. And Rogers says, well, right. Might be time to block with equipment here because I want to keep as many cards as I can going into a turn where you're almost certain to try and strip them away from me. So I'll oh take my. a whopping six. That's incredible. The fact that Matt Rogers has opted to just take this turn is uh, frankly quite interesting to me in the sense that we've been discussing that danger zone while storm striders are still up you need to maintain a double digit life total so you do not get gooned uh by a storm strider kind of combo play and matt rogers is just saying looking at michael hamilton and calling his bluff and saying i will take this because you can't goon me again uh I, you know how many times can you just absolutely stop me but that's what Icelander does. The deck is built to just punish these go wide plays and really stop the plan that Matt Hat Rogers had in his mind. But four is what he's going to be presenting right now. And that's just the first, that's just the beginning of the story. But Michael Hamilton is kind of taking this as his own choose your own adventure. He's going to have some agency in terms of what Matt Rogers oh, yeah. is going to be able to do. Rogers is absolutely in the kill zone. For oh, Hamilton. no. Here's an another one. Yep. Instant speed coming out of the arsenal. Here's a. Here's a Frostbite here, and of course, Hypothermia, a devastating card for any deck that wants to go remotely wide, saying, when you are afflicted by this card, attacks you control can't gain go again. Now, Mechanologist cards don't normally have go again printed on them. They come as a result of the boost. They gain it from boosting. And so Hypothermia here is effective in that uh, Matt Rogers says, well, can't gain go again. Well, that was a nice turn, I guess. Guess I won't do anything after this. Now, now, he boosts in this turn, if I'm not mistaken, right? So, yes. Achilles Accelerator should be able to give him an action point if he feels the need to keep trying to fight through. But again, that next attack can't gain go again by any mechanism. Yep, so Achilles Accelerator, the leg piece here at instant speed, you can destroy it to gain one action point. Activate it if, only, if you've boosted this turn, which he has done. So it is an opportunity to go ahead and get another action. But if that other action is just a three or four attack with boost... It's not worth it. Uh, yeah. I feel like this is a situation where you might need to hang on to it. Not to mention, it does have Arcane Barrier 1. You need that Arcane right Barrier 1. You absolutely need to just hover uh, and, and protect that leg piece. There's nothing. Uh, that one action point is never going to be more valuable uh, in a non-lethal scenario than that uh, Arcane Barrier 1 that it presents. So at this juncture, again, Michael uh, Matt Rogers basically took a lot of damage to say, all right, you can't hypothermia me again, and I've got a hand that I want to send your way that I, I had from last turn. And basically, Matt Rogers is saying, all right, you delayed 
you delayed it one turn. Can you do it twice? And Michael Hamilton said, yeah, I well, can. Yes, I can. Yes. <laughs> so dirty. I'm Michael freaking Hamilton is what he said right there. And it's a block here with the finals fighting spirit, if I'm not mistaken. So Hamilton again, uh, getting the turn, essentially a two block into a three block via that mechanism. Ah, he's doing it. He's going for the Achilles, et cetera. And he says, no, you will not shut my turn down. He, he realizes there he also has to pay one to activate that at instant. I thought that maybe he could have activated it in response um, to the hypothermia. So we wouldn't have to pay for it because it wouldn't have been a frostbite in play, but he opts to do it now. And he's going to, okay, now he's going to go for the Teclo Foundry Heart as well. Try and get some extra resources. Maybe he was a little bit low after having to pay for that frostbite. But he's going for it. AB be damned. Matt Rogers is trying to finish Hamilton off here. This is a very risky gambit. This is a, 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 a situation where he's, and he's playing the, uh, sorry, the Tome of Fyandal from Arsenal. Draw some cards. You're going to go ahead and also pick up uh, some life as well as just drawing up here. So he's also going to yeah. be gaining some life here. However, that's the end of the story because that yeah. is a non-attack action that does not have go again. So he's just drawing cards and gaining life. And Matt Rogers now is just kind of getting back to the top of, again, interesting move here by Matt Rogers to sacrifice the, Axili uh, the Achilles Accelerator purely to gain life. Yeah, again, he doesn't want to probably get that card stuck in his arsenal as well. Eventually, like, that just has to go. Uh, that Tomo Findle. And so it is removed. Matt Rogers gains the life. The card draw less relevant because he was going to the end of his turn anyway. And here comes a scar for a scar from Hamilton, who is still at lower life than Matt Rogers. And so it'll be four damage with go again. And Matt Rogers starting to put the equipment in front for some blocks here, considering a four block right now with the Foundry Heart, plus a zero to 60. Michael Hamilton here presenting, uh, mentioning to Matt, just showing you, okay, I got two cards left, just so you know. Uh, that is a four go again, and he's going to go ahead and pitch away. Mm. The And it's, he's pitching away the heart of Findel as well, so Michael Hamilton getting so much value off of this turn, gaining life and presenting so much attack here as Matt Rogers at that 15 life. It's a nice place to be, but we talked about this earlier. That is going to get shaved away, and you need to protect it because you can just get blown out. You could present lethal, and then Storm Striders just flips the table on you here as... Again, yeah. Wounded Bull for eight is a massive attack to look at. So that's a huge attack. And it's just as well that Hamilton has it because he drew a hand with three red cards. It was a Findle's Fighting Spirit, a Wounded Bull, Scar for a Scar, and then the Heart of Findle. So Hamilton knows there's no point arsling here because I don't have a non-attack wizard action that I can use to try and combine with these Storm Striders from, from Arsenal necessarily or use that Icelander ability. So Hamilton here is saying, I cannot arsenal. I've drawn a hand that is not always what you love to see. The fact that the upside is that Hamilton could just threaten 12 damage when Rogers is at 15. So that's obviously fantastic. But next turn, if I'm not mistaken, Hamilton won't be able to play anything from his arsenal. So if he's going to do anything, it has to be via the Storm Striders. And of course, that would then unlock his waning moon if he wanted to go for it. It's a little scary, to be honest, going into this part of the game and drawing a triple red hand. Well, what Michael Hamilton no longer has access to necessarily is uh, some sort of disruption. I think what Michael Hamilton can lean on, if necessary, is if he picks up a Aether Ice Vein, uh, he can go ahead and pop his Striders and go for it. Keep in mind, he still has the Tunic uh, resource that's available, right? So you can use that to pay for your Striders, pitch a blue, play Ice Vein, fuse it, and then you can pretty much, uh, again, stop Matt Rogers in his tracks. But you are giving up an arsenal, which means you're giving up potential to disrupt what Matt Rogers wants to do. This game is far from over. Michael Hamilton still has outs if necessary, if he wants to stop a big turn. But if Matt Rogers finds the right boost recipe here, this could be over in a flash. Now, remember, Icelander can still create frostbites if Hamilton is able to play an ice card at instant speed this turn. Again, like Flake pointed out, Tunic counter being up into the Storm Striders is a pretty efficient way to do it. But I mean, I, I'm curious to see how Hamilton fights his way out of it. Maybe you're fusing something, right? Tapping into that Insidious Chill that's already on the battlefield, bearing in mind that Rogers gave up two cards to block in that previous turn. So, you know, Michael Hamilton might not suffer too much of a tempo loss for not having an arsenal, given that Rogers is a little bit light on uh, cardboard here to chuck across the table. This is still a relevant amount of damage. Hamilton has to consider... Just how scary it would be, how low he might go, because of course, the full suite of items is still present for Matt Rogers, right? There's a counter on that Plasma Purifier. The Technical Plasma, plasma Pistol itself has a counter. So you're representing six damage from the pistol to follow up this high-speed impact, potentially. That's something that Michael Hamilton still has to look at and go, All right, maybe some of this equipment might be getting in front this turn. That Goliath Gauntlet is honestly just 
it, he Matt Rogers might be just waiting for the right opportunity to bust he can't it out play it here, right? Because it it has to be two or more cost on your attack action. Correct. Players, right? Uh, so again, it, it's just looming large, and I don't know if it's just a matter of opportunity or the fact that Matt Rogers is just kind of being exceptionally patient with it. But uh, Matt uh, Michael Hamilton at seven, knowing that a lot of the life gain cards are gone, I believe two finals fighting spirits have been played. You've already pitched away the heart of Findel, so Michael Hamilton uh, is is all you know he's gained three life in this uh, in this game already. I believe uh, could be four if I'm not mistaken, and by, but I think it's three. But yeah, the Goliath Gauntlet is going to connect with an attack, and Matt Rogers is eventually going to try to close this out. Uh, if if Matt Rogers can pressure here and maintain a state where Michael Hamilton is playing without an arsenal, that's a good place to be. Matt Rogers ha has the tempo here, but again, the X factor is always those wizard boots. They can just be, you know, bust out of nowhere and really change the dynamic of what this game is. Hamilton in the tank here, and he can't blame the guys. He he can sort of see what's on Rogers' board right now, what he sort of has to contend with. If the only card Hamilton can sort of play something is like an Ice Eternal, just like with a ton, a ton of, you know, uh, pitch thrown into it, there is a Frost Tex here. Rogers might get completely gummed up. I mean, you know, if Hamilton can uh, apply, it'd take a fair few uh, sort of uh, Frostbite tokens to stop Rogers here, but that's an option. Having one Frost Tex deployed, many people sort of sneer at that, but becomes more and more relevant when Hamilton's able to fuse, uh, you know, for X equals three, an Ice Eternal, for example. I mean, even on 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 base cost, being able to storm striders and emeritus scolding and poke with waning moon. Oh, that's is, is nice damage, but it's it's not enough to kill Rogers. That's only seven. No, you're not there yet. But again, if you can do all this and maintain an arsenal, then you can respond to a play and basically kill Matt Rogers uh, as the ability to arcane barrier one is no longer there. You've got the two off of the the headpiece and that's always going to stay there that's a good thing to have ultimately though you know at two is not three or four or five as it is you can you know it, it it eventually if matt rogers gets caught with like a red card in hand it could get very dangerous but michael hamilton again is just kind of looking looking down at matt rogers's play here maybe there's an opportunity here he said ice eternal if you can create some frostbites to stop the turn and matt rogers yeah. has no opportunity to pay through it that could it's be not it. Well, that's it. It's not just a matter of ending the turn for Matt Rogers. It's also the damage that it's going to inflict at, uh, at Matt Rogers and uh, sort of shift tempo perhaps back to Michael Hamilton, giving him an opportunity for an arsenal. My Michael Hamilton might here might just tank the four, go down to three, if it means him regaining a lot of the uh, the tempo that's, uh, that he He's doing desperately it. needs. Wow. He takes that hit. That is pretty insane. High Speed Impact says the next boosted attack gains dominate on this chain. What else does Matt Rogers have? He knows he can't empty his hand. Rogers probably needs to keep something back to answer arcane damage that would otherwise come his way. Foundry Heart used there. Picks up to three resources. Matt wants to keep a surplus. And he's, he's going to come in. He's going for this. So this is a yellow zipper hit. So it's four. But I've, I'm pretty sure it has dominate as a result of that High Speed Impact having hit. Yeah, that was, it seems like ages ago where that high speed impact was presented as damage as a high speed impact again says if I, if it hits the next attack that boosts gets dominated and that, that zipper hit boosted. So three now, again, it's not that it's, it's a devastating thing to block through You know, that four dominate is really going to change the dynamic. It was always going to get some sort of block from Michael Hamilton and keep in mind, Coronet peak there still does block for Michael Hamilton. Uh, yeah. Coronet peak in this matchup here is not necessarily the, the utility of using the ability of Coronet peak. It's frankly, it's just two, it's two block okay. here. Going to two. Rogers obviously has options. He can go over the pistol here. First, he'll put a counter on the induction chamber. Then he'll remove one from the Purify. This is going to boost his pistol's power now to three. Here comes the first pistol shot. Threatening lethal at Michael Hamilton, who still has three cards in his hand and a tunic counter, and it's go time, Flake. There it goes. No, he's going to actually... He's going to opt in this case to use the... Uh, use the gauntlets and the... I, I, th I thought, like you said, perhaps maybe it was... Storm Strider's time. We're not quite there yet. No, Again, it might be Tunic Coronet Peak for the next pistol attack here. It might just give him all the equips. Yeah, and that's perfectly fine here because Michael Hamilton might be able to present an attack and an arsenal 
and then on the tur follow up turn, it's it's go time with Storm Strider. So yeah, all the equipment is now gone. Corn at peak doing its job. You use the resource from Tunic. That Tunic only got one resource throughout this entire game. That's yeah. fascinating. All right, Corn at peak never used there as well on Rogers Hamilton though, getting full value out of this equipment, and it's a fused Ether Ice Fang coming in here. Such a big deal. Now okay. as Rogers has well, to decide what to do about this. It's Hamilton's turn right now. This is Hamilton's turn, and this is going to be played a red Aether Ice Vein for five. It is fused, which means if it does connect, you're going to give me some cards. But also, Insidious Chill, you're going to give me some cards or pay. So that's what Matt Rogers is doing, pitching Teclacor, paying the first tax. There's only two AB here, so three is going to leak through. This yeah. is the setup, uh, Uber. While you still have those Storm Striders there, you do know that Michael Hamilton is going to be pocketing the Aether Hail, and, uh, but the the move here is to see how many cards he can take out of matt rogers hand uh this is the setup it's peel as many cards away as possible do a little bit of damage get them to single digits and on matt rogers next turn when matt rogers presents an attack it's aether hail storm striders and giddy up matt rogers in extreme danger right now which is fascinating to say. The... Look at the life total, Zuber. The fact that you say that is so incredible. Like, you know, like it's it's Matt Rogers who is, you know, has has his full hand, has an, a nine-point life total, Michael Hamilton hanging by a thread, but Matt Rogers is the one who's on Hanging the hook three. here. Here we go. Discard unless you pay two. I'll pay two, he says, after taking three, because he only has AB2 remaining. Amulet of Ice comes down on his turn, and can be used straight away to force another discard unless you pay two effect from Matt Rogers. Oh, dear. Again, yeah, if it's... Rogers comes back to his turn with no cards in his hand, Michael Hamilton, I mean, it's open season for the Wizard player. This is where you want to be. Single digits, and it's your turn, essentially, as uh, Matt Rogers is saying, all right, well, I can't do anything. Like, you know, like this, this is, this is it. I blocked on my turn. Here's the deal. Matt Rogers can say, okay, I'll move to Arsenal. And my, and Michael Hamilton's going to say, oh, really? Okay. Cool story, bro. Hold on. We're not done here. As Michael Hamilton is essentially just completely, you know, just eviscerated my, uh, Matt Rogers hand here to taxation. And, uh, Matt Rogers is holding on to, uh, his own hand. And spent so much just to pay the, the taxes that uh, Insidious Chill and Aether Ice Vein represented. And now he's got an Arsenal Uber. He's going to say, move to Arsenal. If that's a blue card or a red card or a color that doesn't even exist yet, I don't think that's enough to bust through the Aether Hail, the Waning Moon, and a potential uh, Storm Striders. If he moves to Arsenal, um, it's like just an Ice Eternal for X equals three can, can do the job here. We'll create one for us by being played in your opponent's turn then three frostbites then do three damage so matt goes to four <laughs> and then uh obviously matt would then take three damage from those frostbites expiring here i mean and again because you're already moving to your end step um and this is all happening at instant speed you you don't you don't have the way to sort of as far as i understand to pay through them you you need obviously like instant speed abilities that would have to be activated that would be the achilles accelerator Gives you an opportunity to do that, but a lot of your like your the abilities attached to your items are actions. So Matt Rogers does the thing. Here comes Aether Hale out of Arsenal for Michael Hamilton. Not quite the Ice Eternal dream, but pretty darn close here. Again, putting pressure on. It's two damage coming across in that Aether Hale here. Matt Rogers having to decide how he copes with this. The amount of damage in the various sources that are are that Michael Hamilton is, is getting that damage from. So there it is. It is a blue. So he's going to pitch away one here. Oh, sorry. No, he's thinking about it here. Okay. So the, the, again, Aether Hail representing, I believe it's two damage. It's, um, yep. two damage. It is an ice card frostbite in conjunction with frost text. Also some damage there as well. It will well. be a waning moon too. Waning moon on Matt Rogers turn. That is three AB. So Rogers opts to take the first two damage off that uh, Aether Hail. Uh, blue left in his hand. From the looks of it, probably not a card that he much cares about arsenaling. So he will be incentivized eventually to spend this. But only AB2. So at least one of this Waning Moon damage is going to connect. Let's 
just keep in mind as well the efficiency of that blue pitch here. That blue pitch has been an Aether Hail and a Waning Moon. It's been Frostbite plus five uh, Arcane Damage, six technically with the Frost Hex. So that blue pitch has essentially represented six, six Arcane Damage. Incredible. Incredible value off of the blue pitch. And Michael Hamilton still has three cards in hand. Uh, Rogers here having to decide what happens if I let this go if i pitch to this and i don't know hamilton just says okay go to my turn or before my, rogers has a chance to draw any more cards hamilton tries to do other hijinks i mean I, it's hard to say how many more cards are left in his hand maybe two, if he has two cards in his hand still then there's the potential to do something really nasty that's what's so awesome about the wizard class is that there's no safety zones. There's no kind of comfort areas for your opponent because you are, you are always able to do some, you know, hocus pocus on their side. You can always just pull a rabbit out of your hat on their turn. And again, cards like storm striders is such a factor. Storm striders basically tells your opponent. It's not about this turn. My friend, it's about what happens after this turn. It's about what this turn represents for my next turn. And the fact that I can just basically bust these out whenever the hell I want and finish you off as Matt Rogers. Now is still just waiting in limbo here. He said, all right, I'm moving to arsenal. Any actions? And Michael Hamilton said, Oh, I got actions. Mofo. I've got actions for days. I've been at living a, on a on a prayer and a dream, this whole this whole game for me has been about duct tape and and you know thoughts and prayers. And Michael Hamilton now is getting rewarded as Matt Rogers had his hand peeled away. He is still waiting there in no man's land, waiting to arsenal this card. But it's a blue, so that is at least a little bit of help here for He's Matt Rogers. Three cards in his hand. Oh God, it's three cards for Hamilton. There's so much more he can do here, even with this blue being thrown in. Okay, like Roger says, well, Chief, <laughs> here's, here's my blue throttle in the pitch. I'm going to try to eat up some of this arcade. What's fascinating here is if he if Matt Rogers has infinite pitch, I don't even think that's enough because there's only AB2 on the on the board. That could have been green pitch, purple pitch, Take one. indigo pitch. And it, there's a good chance that it wouldn't have been enough. All right. What we got here then? Oh, so there is an opportunity here perhaps. Like, you could if you want to oh, yeah, actually... he had an action point. Yeah, so he still gets... Oh, I see. He's busting up the Frost uh, the frost by just busting up the... Uh, yep. By breaking the Goliath Gauntlet here. A fascinating move. Again, the priority went back to Matt Rogers, and he had another opportunity to sort of go ahead and make another action as the action point still existed, but there's no... But there's three cards in Michael Hamilton's hand. There yep. is no resources floating. Matt Rogers is just swimming out there on the open sea, completely naked, and there's a Storm Striders lurking about. Michael Hamilton is smelling blood in the water. Matt Rogers at four. You do not want to be four with <laughs> only, with not the right IB. And oh my god, Scar for a Scar presenting perfect lethal. Pretty good. Yeah, but this is obviously a tech against Prism as well. If they would take an instant action when you pass priority at the end of your turn and you still had an action point, you could then still take an action. So that's what Roger's doing there uh, to get rid of that Frostbite. Okay, well, take one. To the Scar for a Scar. Nice little pull there for Hamilton, who will be eternally lower life than Matt Rogers until uh, he is either the winner or the loser of this match. So very, very efficient. Nice to have that come out of the hand here. And Michael Hamilton looks at his opponent and he says, right, well, you can only, if I can hit you with, God, anything. Uh, obviously, five damage straight off the top from like a red ether ice vein would do the job. Uh, you just don't have the arcane barrier to fight through that. Also worth noting that Michael Hamilton and Matt Rogers played this game after Michael Hamilton traveled back from Ohio playing in that fall brawl uh, out there in Columbus. So uh, no rest for the wicked here as Michael Hamilton, you know, basically, um, uh, you know, kicked names and took ass in Ohio. And he's back at it right now, taking the N New Zealand national champion to the brink here, just hanging on by a thread. But that's all you need. You just need one, a chip at a chair, as they say. And you got a chance here. And being able to play at instant speed is such an advantage. And that early onslaught that Matt Rogers presented seems like eons ago as Michael Hamilton is just, you know, circling around and waiting to pull the trigger on those wizard boots. Reluctantly, Rogers will open his turn here by putting a counter on his pistol, trying to keep as many cards and in his hand and as much information private from Hamilton before Hamilton decides to make his own gambit to end the game. I love Hamilton. how 
how like reluctant it is. Like every little move that you make, Matt Rogers is like, can, can I can I do this? Can I like it's not a matter of uncertainty that it is the correct play. It's uncertainty that it's more like asking permission of the Icelander player, being like, I, I I'm gonna do this. Is this okay? And then there's this <laughs> And there's a clapback as Ice Eternals played out of the arsenal. It's fused, but for how much? X is one by the looks of things here. So Frostbite going to be created by this being played on Rogers' turn. Then one Frostbite generated from Ice Eternal having been fused. And one damage. Ping, ping. Still relevant because it's a fuse. So that Insidious Chill is on board and will still have an impact. Okay, but hold on a second. That one AB, you have to pay above rate to get rid of that because you only have access to AB2. Right so everybody who's listening up to this who might not necessarily be completely familiar with how AB works, you can you can uh, deal with this AB1 by paying one if you have AB1. But if all you have is Arcane Barrier 2 and one is presented, you still have to pay the mm. AB2 to absorb that one. So you are have to double down on paying for this one damage, which is pretty nasty. Matt Rogers might right now just be wishing he still had the accelerators. Takes one, says Rogers. Now, there is the small matter of, a, of the Insidious Chill effect, if I'm not mistaken, that needs to be resolved. Looks like Storm Striders are coming out anyway, though. Boom! Oh. Merida scolding! Four damage! I don't That's think there's it. any way to get out of that as AB2 is all you have left and two is there. There is no other way to deal with that Ar uh, arcane damage. Michael Hamilton walked to the edge, looked over, and then pushed Matt right off the cliff. What a matchup between these two national champions. Yeah, absolutely fantastic play from both sides. I mean, Matt Rogers is really starting to get slowed down a whole lot. He makes a a big play with that Tome of Findle with the extra action point off the Achilles Accelerator, rather, to just gain some life, just to stay in the match. And we talk so much about Icelander uh, took 18 damage, you know, very in the first few turns of the game and went so low. We said, hey, I mean, this is still scary. You might have ways of gaining life, but you don't have that much to start with here. And you can see that Matt Rogers knew he was on a timer. He knew he was on a clock and he knew what the Icelander would be able to do to him late in the game. I mean, like the twist of the knife, is the four, forcing Rogers to potentially pay two to stop that one arcane damage coming in with only a one piece of AB2 equipment left. Really rough stuff for him. And you can see just why Iceland is considered to be so freakishly strong. It was an Ice Eternal. And of course, there was an Emerita Scolding both on Matt Rogers' turn there. You basically get to take those two turns back to back. You need more than that 10 life buffer if you want to try and end the game against a wizard. So scary, but so well played by both sides here. Matt Rogers really knowing how to try and tease this action out of Michael Hamilton, but Emerita scolding in that last turn is always going to be very scary. Yeah, you kind of basically take the risk. You get rid of your AB1. You just kind of go up and say that, all right, I got you to one. I, I don't need these ABs if I can just kind of present lethal constantly. And if you can't close the deal, I win. And ultimately, uh, Michael Hamilton has proved again that he's likely the best. Uh, maybe you know, probably the best Icelander player in the world, but a fair argument that he's also just the flat out best flesh and blood player that is out there. Not too shabby for somebody who picked up the game in late 2021, Flake. Really impressive stuff from Michael Hamilton. He will advance now in our Goliath Gauntlet flesh and blood invitational to take on the winner of Isaac Crute and Margin Bay. So potentially a another Icelander matchup awaiting Hamilton. You have to think he's pretty confident. Or could it be Briar? That's all to be decided, of course, later on. We still got that last quarterfinal to play. Again, huge shout out to KFAM Cards for their support of this Goliath Corner. And thanks to you for staying tuned so far. We'll be back after this with our last quarterfinal matchup. The Goliath Gauntlet is brought to you by Kayfabe Cards, where reality and fantasy meet. Go to kayfabecards.com for all your Pokemon, Magic the Gathering, and flesh and blood needs. Kayfabe Cards. Be who you want to be. Another matchup heading your way here for the quarterfinals of the Goliath Gauntlet. Hitting you with that Wednesday action. Yes, you know that the NFL owns Thursday night, Sunday night, 
Monday night. We got Wednesday night, Tannen. That's that's our domain now. We're hitting you with some uh, a little midweek sauce. Yeah, get you through hump day, you know, a little midweek uh, pick me up. You know, for everybody at home that's got to work the typical nine to five, something you know you and I aren't super accustomed to, but you know, uh, whatever. And like you said, it's gonna be some good action here tonight. We got some really great players. No, some definitely some great players. Again, you all know Isaac Crute. Everybody knows Isaac Crute. I specifically know Isaac Crute because he's the, for you. Yeah. Oh, he's the fat L on my uh, on my <laughs> on my uh, round one all the time. He's my X one every single time we play a tournament here in Toronto. But otherwise, there's a there's a cast of players here at this tournament, one of which you are pretty high on that many other people might not know very well. Yeah, exactly. Tell you what, let's talk about both of them from, from my side, because like I got to say a little thing about Isaac as well, because uh, unbelievable player. You know, we talked about this. We had the the big debate on Instant Speed podcast, like who's the best player in the world. And the names usually come down to, you know, Hamilton, you know, uh, Tark Patel, you know, Pablo Pintor. And I was like, look, if it's not one of those guys, my pick is Isaac Crude. I think he's one of the best players in the world, especially when he's practiced. You know, his top eight run, his top four run at the first Pro Tour came off the heels of almost barely testing. And so, so how do you think it's going to happen when he's like, fully powered and ready to go at events. But sitting across from him as a player that you were just referencing, that's Caleb Van Patten, or as everybody probably knows him as, this Majin Bay. God, is he a big, just a great looking dude being. Anyway. Focus, it's focus. Distracting. It's distracting, I, I'm sorry. It, okay, all right. I think maybe a little fan down just a little bit, but so Caleb may not have the resume that some of these players do in this event. Um, I mean, it, it's hard to, right? Some of these guys have just got absurd resumes, but. Caleb is one hell of a card player. I've played him in, you know, this game of Flesh and Blood. I've seen him play other games. He's, you know, a god in Legends of Runeterra. And, you know, when you play somebody and you just know right away, you're like, this this guy gets it, this person gets it. You, you get that vibe immediately from Caleb. And he's one of the better players in this entire event. And he's showing it here already with, you know, a big win in round one. And then if he wins this round, this is another really big feather in his cap because he's got to run through a lot of really good players if he wants to win this event. Yeah, there's no easy outs in this tournament at all. And like you mentioned, Caleb Van Patten, a.k.a. Majin Bay, uh, might not be on your radar. But perhaps by the end of this tournament, he will be because he is already a shining star in, like you mentioned, Legends of Runeterra, one of the number one ranked players in the world consistently and doing it while streaming and entertaining the living hell out of everybody. But uh, they have their work cut out for them, both of these players, frankly, as they don't necessarily get to play against each other very often. But here they are at the Goliath Gauntlet, ready to face off. Let's uh, dig into the decks there, Tan, and we'll start with Isaac. How about that? Yeah, and so with Isaac, you know, if you watched anything of round one, uh, I hope you didn't blink because you might have missed the game because he ended up destroying Hayden Dale pretty quickly, unfortunately for Hayden. Um, he's playing Briar, Isaac Kurt is, and he's playing kind of the Briar deck that was very much like Matthew Folks's list that he won the Pro Tour with. This one's leaning a little heavier into drawing extra cards during a turn, and if it has a Channel Mount Heroic out, it's going to probably kill you in one turn or two. You know, you're looking at cards like Overload, Promise of Plenty, cards that you don't always see in Briar List, but in this one, it's a little more combo-centric. And boy, do we see it. If you haven't seen that VOD yet, go ahead, pause this video right now, back up a little bit, get the, the story before this, and watch that absurd turn against Hayden Dale. I think he attacked for well over 30. It was nasty. Aiden Dale, uh, you know, holding the big stick, never got to really swing it as much. But again, we'll see how this one shapes up as we move over to Majin Bay playing on Icelander and a lot of disruption in this list. Uh, it, it, it's a fairly, uh, I, I dare I say, standard fare now. As uh, ever now, right? Well, yeah. <laughs> it seems stock. Ever since Michael Hamilton basically took right. Icelander and, and turned it upside down, here's what we've got. And uh, you've got your Wounded Bulls, your fi Findel's Fighting Spirits, some Enlightened Strikes. But uh, overall, I mean, this list has been very, very potent. I just love that we call Wounded Bull stock now, you know, a <laughs> card that you might not have even seen in its day and limited that much. Like, obviously, the card's great. You know, it's a, it's a seven for three, but only blocked for two in a format where you really wanted to block for three in limited without going too far into a Welcome to Wraith limited. But it's just been an all star in these decks, you know, along with uh, Fendal's Fighting Spirit and cards like that. Just, you know, huge ways to really punish your opponent for bringing the wrong equipment. To the matchup and making them kind of have to guess which way they're going to get attacked right and i know you're a big fan of this deck just like i am every time i watch it i feel like i learned something new and this is the kind of deck that really gives people fits because it's very good at playing on your opponent's turn and your own turn and you're never sure exactly how you're going to be attacked 
it's running eight Aether Ice Veins, a pocket of uh, a pair a pair of yellows in there, wedged between obviously the three of blues and reds, which most uh, of the Icelander players are, are bringing to the party. Uh, your Scar for Scars, uh, obviously uh, some Sink Belows for defensive capabilities, Epots, uh, Frost Hexes, and Channel Lake Frigids. Those are, are going to be something to take, uh, take note of as those are going to get some work done for sure. Both players... Are no uh, I, I, no stranger to this matchup in general, but perhaps this might be the first time that these two have ever faced off uh, at such stakes. Let's say so. Uh, without further ado, Tanner, I think we're ready to rock and roll. Get into this game. It's Isaac Crute on Briar versus Majin Bay on Icelander. And some of these cards that are like you mentioned are gonna be really important for Majin Bay here. He's gonna have to make sure that he gets his attacks in and his big attacks in when he can. And cards like this, Findle's Fighting Spirit, you know, just gaining a little extra life here or there is gonna be really, really important. He's already up to 37 since he starts at 36. And when this attacks for seven, it's if your life total is lower than your opponent's, you gain a life. And you know, one doesn't sound like much, but you know, there's there's a lot of instances where Majin can win the game at one, two, or three. And those extra life points that he's going to get from this or Heart of Findall, just give him enough to get over the finish line to win this game. Just given the whole yard sale here to go ahead and block out the seven here, no, uh, no, you know, no, no detriment uh, if you're on that quote unquote turn zero on the defending uh, on the receiving end. Isaac Crude is able to go ahead and basically just you know, dump the hand, uh, preserve life and, and get things going. But on Majin Bay's side, he's able to go ahead, pocket a card, gain a life. So there is some work done as both players also running tunic. So Majin Bay gets the first crack at a, a full tunic if necessary. And now it's a, uh, it's action to Isaac. Yeah. And this is a card that like, it's not as good as you think it would be. And it's a deck that's going to try to arsenal every turn because most likely Majin is going to be able to play his arsenal cards out. It does look like he's going to want to save this one and just double block here. Maybe something that he can't play out of arsenal because everybody knows at home, if you're an ice blender, if you have a blue in your arsenal, you can play it during your opponent's turn, but it's still a card that he has to respect. And it's still a card that Isaac wants to play in this matchup because it forces Majin's hand. Maybe sometimes when he doesn't want to do it just yet. So first order of business, again, just sort of dodging uh, some of those uh, detrimental pieces. And hey, there's the first wheel of Heart of Findel, a card that, again, very hard to pull out of a pack. Trust me, I know. But uh, again, pull any of the fables, I, it, I've yet to pull one. I think I've opened maybe about 30 boxes in my life. I haven't yet to pull people fables. <laughs> oh, I, I, hey, I held a pack of alpha that had yep. a cold foil Heart of Findel in it. However, that was passed off to Nick Bolas, who then opened it uh, for Keith at, at Realm Gaming. But I was I was luck adjacent at all times, uh, Tannen, luck go. adjacent. All right, and so this is an attack with Aether Ice Vein. It's a red one, so this is going to deal five damage to Isaac Crute. A life was gained by Majin Bay there because of the Heart of Findall, and then it was actually uh, fused as well, so it is going to get a card from Crute here as well. So, and then he's going to go ahead and put that card into his arsenal, so really good turn for Majin. You can see why he wanted to protect that arsenal so much last turn, because it was a card he couldn't play, but a card that's very important. And uh, here's everyone's favorite combo, Flake. Oh boy, yeah. It's, uh, what if I told you that the little is just ridiculous? In this case, we're going to go ahead and show the overload, satisfying the criteria for Belittle to go fetch the Minnowism. The question here is uh, what kind of Minnowisms is Isaac Crute packing in this deck? And, uh, three and one. Yeah, three reds, one blue. So you got the fuel if you need it, but you also got the gas if you need it. Both of those are the same word, I guess, with meaning the same thing. But you know what I mean in card game terms, right? Yeah, so for everybody at home, uh, you have two variations here. The red one uh, pumps your next attack by three, so this is pretty good in, in Briar for multiple reasons. A, you want to do a lot of extra damage, and it starts to satisfy the Rosetta Thorn thing of playing an attack action and not attack action. This pushes a lot of extra damage. Or you can go get the blue one when you need more resources, which is something that will come up here against Majin Bay multiple times this matchup because of something like this. Since he's playing Cold Snap from his arsenal, it is a blue card that allows him to do that during his opponent's turn. It is an ice card, so this is going to give a frostbite over to Isaac Crute and make his next thing cost one more. Now, anyone who's played Briar, I know you and I both have quite a bit, Flake. Anyone who's played Briar knows that usually your turn is mapped out down to the very last resource, and you generally don't have extra sitting around. So very advantageous for Majin Bay to get the ice, uh, the frostbites, in just the right moment. Yeah, and timing it correctly is going to be important as well. Uh, but I think that both of these players, the playing at the highest levels, know that uh, you know what's what's coming. So you don't you can't necessarily catch somebody like Isaac Crute off guard. He'll know 
uh, that there's probably something in there that's uh, that's going to really be a detriment to him. So he's taking that into account. In this case, however, Minnowism into Overload is a beautiful combo as what it's doing over here is it's pumping up the Overload to six. Uh, it's also giving that Overload Dominate. And if it hits... It gets to get uh, it gains go again, so it's doing so much extra work here. It's really turning that overload into an unassuming uh, from an unassuming card into a mini powerhouse. Yeah, absolutely. And this is kind of what Kurt's going to try to do: is these big elaborate turns. Now, it won't always be like the Phi type turns where you're going to have you know five attacks. You're going to have one or two attacks, but they're going to be big. And they're going to be followed up by Rosetta Thorn a lot of the times. And he's going to try to keep the life total on Majin Basalt as low as possible so that he doesn't ever have to get in a position where he needs to start worrying about his own life total more. Because if Majin ever gets him in a spot where he's a little far ahead, it's going to be really rough on Isaac because he's going to have to start sandbagging some of those blues to try to not die on one of the turns from Majin. And here we go, another Aether Ice Vein that's going to be revealing an Ice card here for Majin. He's just firing all cylinders so far here. Yeah, he does not want to relent. That Aether Ice Vein being fused with the Insidious Chill is going to be a nasty piece. Looking at what uh, Isaac Kurt's packing here, he's got AB1. So you're you're kind of going balls to the walls here when it comes to trading damage. You don't necessarily care too much about uh, the damage being dealt to you, but eventually, if it's going to continue to peel cards away like this, um, this Aether Ice Vein will do, it just it nerfs your future turns here. So Isaac Kurt's going to put in some work here. He's going to pitch the blue burgeoning um to go ahead and perhaps absorb one of the damage and pay the rest to avoid discarding a card so one card is going to at least allow isaac to have some clap back here and this is where you see the real difference in the aggressive deck builds you know we've seen Phi in this tournament and while i think that deck is very good it it can run into some problems because the icelander in these exact turns because they don't run a ton of blues right you know, it's just a bunch of red line type deck and so uh, stopping cards like Aether Ice Vein are difficult. Isaac has a large number of blues in his deck. So situations like this where he can pay the two, sink the extra one into an Arcane Barrier, it's actually a fine uh, deal for him at this point. Here we go. We got a Sonata Arcanics hitting Isaac. Uh, very, if you, again, we mentioned that first match. If you watch it, he had some huge hits in that match. So let's see if this will propel him to another win here today. Majin's going to go ahead and use the Tunic and the Metacarpus nodes to... Uh, Deal with the one arcane that's coming from the Sonata Arcanics. Look how handsome Majin Bay looks in that picture. Oh. That is from the Sears Portrait Studio for sure. So oh, yeah. handsome. I mean, I'm pretty if sure that is the stock photo that comes in the frames now when you buy yes. them. Yes. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Like, this, this is so good. We're making you the stock frame. And look, nothing to be said about taking away from Isaac Crude here. I'm actually very distracted during this game. You have to be able to tell it's 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 hard to focus on the games when we have two lookers like this in the match i'm and uh being a wizard player actually i, I don't know if you knew this tannin but majin bay's only fans uh screen name is metacarpus nudes i don't know if you knew oh, that wow okay so yes. is, is, it, is it at least tasteful is it they're least... tasteful nudes absolutely okay, sure. metacarpus right. nudes go uh, and check majin bay's <laughs> wizard totally themed that, only fans way. it totally has totally to be somebody immediately is going to listen to this and go register metacarpus nudes yeah <laughs> So good. Great, great mark, old TM on the back. Yeah. <laughs> Majin Bay, uh, really a wizard player. Before Icelander uh, came to CC, he was all about Kano and really put the time in, the work in, and just fell onto that hero. And that's part of where his, you know, his friendship with somebody like Brendan Patrick really came to fruition because of the both of them being very big Kano players. So yeah. here he is on his new fave Bay, which is Icelander, and trying to deal with Isaac Krut, the silent assassin of the North. And, uh, you know, we mentioned Nationals of Michael Hamilton winning and putting this deck on the map. Uh, you know, you and I are friends of Majin Bay. In fact, I had dinner with him at, at Nats uh, during that weekend, and he saw Hamilton's deck, and he was salivating when he saw the deck. He was like, I can't wait to play this. You know, he ended up playing it in one of the uh, the Sunday events, like trying to reverse engineer. He was watching the stream on his phone, like reverse engineering the deck. You know, he's like Tony Stark in the lab, like putting it mm -hmm. all together, figuring it all out. So Michael was, Hamilton yeah, built this fun. deck in a cave. With a With box of crap. bulk. It looks like it that way. I mean, when you're talking about wounded bulls and find well, those fighting happened. spirits, it looks like a box of scraps. That's actually what happened. He just, he just went into the lab, went through, went through all the cards in history. He said he went through uh, the whole database of all the cards. And, you know, he's like, oh, look, I, f I found a wounded bull and it, it works. And so uh, now he could pirate, pilot, I'm sorry, power his Iron Man suit for days off a single wounded bull and he's good to go. Sounds so good. And in this case, uh, Majin Bay is uh, responding to this 
go against Natch. So again, the turn I believe began. Did it? Did it? It, uh, it began with. Sonata, if I'm not mistaken, could I be wrong? Or are we way way past that? Otherwise, there's still an uh, embodiment of lightning that was created off the Minnowism, and that is going to give this Snatch go again. Now, it's not getting the buff from the Minnowism because Minnowism is looking at cards with base attack three or less. So it's merely the go again that Isaac Crude is valuing here, and the on hit effect of Snatch. And in response, what Majin Bay has done here is played Blizzard to potentially stifle that go again. And again, it does create a frostbite nonetheless because it is an ice card being played by Icelander at uh, at instant speed on the opponent's turn. Yeah, this is exactly what Majin needs to do if he wants to keep up in this matchup. You know, a little bit of damage here or there, but these kinds of taxing effects, like, hey, look, that loses go again unless you pay two. So either that's the last attack you're doing this turn or you need to pay an extra two to keep going. Oh, by the way, you also have a Frostbite. So now this is taking a blue away from Isaac Kurt this turn completely, if he wants to do anything else and keep going from this point. And we all know that generally when you get the first attack on the chain from Briar, they're not done after that. They've got a lot. This isn't Guardian where you're going to be like, all right, attack you with one card, block with the other two. This is, I'm throwing my hand at you every turn. So this matchup can go back and forth, but well-timed, uh, interruption, like we're seeing from Majin Bay here, can go a real long way to put him in the driver's seat. It's really hard sometimes to tell whose turn it is, but again, Isaac Krut uh, on Briar are going to just be, like you mentioned, just vomit the cards onto the onto the uh, the board in as efficient and as proper a sequence as possible here. And uh, there's the block that's being presented that's going to block five, if I'm not mistaken, uh, on top of the snatch and any party tricks that Isaac Krut is bringing to the to the uh, to the show here, I don't see any. No, uh, no razor reflexes, no uh, lightning presses and such. Those were left. It seems like uh, in 2021, possibly, but ultimately, that snatch is going to get stuffed by an e strike and a frost hex. They'll have their day in the sun again. I, I, I fully believe. I miss those cards quite a bit. This is a swarming gloom veil coming in at uh, six. Now, keep in mind there it does get a buff when an aura is created, and that would be the embodiment of lightning. And now the minnowism is finally finding a target as uh, the swarming gloom veil will get go again off of uh, its first criteria being met. But also the fact that it's a base attack three means that minnowism finally, finally has a, a dance partner for this one. So six go again being thrown here at Majin Bay. Yep, Storm and Glueville, one, one of the best attacks in this deck. Really, really good at finishing off the turn here. It's going to have go again, so if there's any resources left over. I think Kurt might have one card left, if I remember right. He's got Rosetta Thorn still sitting here. All right, so there's the Embodiment of Earth. Maybe not going to come up too much this matchup, but Imagine does attack a little bit more than the average wizard, obviously. So it could come up. But it does look like we're going to get no Rosetta Thorn attack here, and that's going to be it. Imagine well, that's weathering what... the storm quite a bit here. That's what you're talking about, the importance of those one little frostbite tokens that get smacked up there and it basically just creating that frostbite saves, saves Majin Bay for life. life. Mm -hmm. You're Absolutely really, you're, you're spot on when you're talking about, you know, these Briar players that really uh, use their, their resources so effectively. There's, there's very little margin to sort of increase that budget in any way. There's no surplus. You, you're, you, this is the, the lunch money you're given. So you better eat well with what you got as Isaac Crute, unfortunately there was a, a buck short on uh, on sending the Rosetta Thorn as Majin Bay stifled that attack. As we take a look at the uh, life totals here, as they get adjusted real quick on for both players, uh, Isaac his stock portfolio. Oh, certainly. I was going to say his Tinder portfolio and found that looked like a stock portfolio to me. <laughs> How's AMC doing? Are we still? Oh, he's high on like uh, NFTs of the faces of all the opponents that he beats. Like every time he beats somebody, he just takes a snapshot of their surprised and you know completely devastated faces and then slams them up on like some nft website or something on his uh on his only fans <laughs> he's he's signing up to uh to metacarpus nudes <laughs> yeah he's gonna put the faces of his of his slain opponents there we go all right i i would definitely subscribe to that oh boy uh man all right so we may, uh, both... we may have lost this this uh this this whole this whole thing flake hey we're getting back onto the rails. We're geolocating ourselves. We're 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 circling back. We're taking the scenic route here. I missed you, buddy. I missed I, you. It's been a while, dude. And we're yeah. gonna be in at Worlds in like a few mm -hmm. days. It's gonna be exciting times all the way around ten. And I'm telling you, nothing Absolutely. gets me more excited than casting flesh and blood with buddies like you. I can't wait, man. It's gonna be uh 
a hell of a tournament, but we've got a little bit that we got to finish up here today. So far, there's another really tight game. Maja at 25, Isaac Hurd at 28. And you know, both these players are going to be at Worlds. Will one of them be a world champion, I think, is going to be a big question because these are two favorites, I have to believe, going into that tournament. And these are going to be two of the heroes that you're going to see a lot of all weekend long as well. I think Icelander might just be the most represented hero. I think you know. you're absolutely right. I honestly do, because until somebody can sort of crack the code on it, um, you know, most of these players who have already put so much time into Icelander are most likely sitting down and, and practicing the mirror is likely, uh, you know, where the line share of their efforts are going to go. And uh, see, so again, Insidious Chill is being played. That is a, an arcanic crackle. It's a little bit of a, a, a mishmash of damage here. Some arcane, some physical, gets a little cumbersome to deal with, but it looks like a timely tunic with the Metacarpus nodes is going to eat up that arcane damage. And speaking of timely, this is an interesting thing that only pretty much happens in this matchup. So for you to play a card from your arsenal during your opponent's turn, you have to have priority and you never have it at the beginning of the turn. So usually they get their first attack in before you can ever get them a Frostbite. The weird thing is, though, since Isaac Root hit last turn and got an Embodiment of Earth, at the beginning of your turn, those pop and go away, and it actually gives a priority window to Majin, and he can start the turn out by giving you a Frostbite to slow you down right away. Not to mention, this is a big deal that this Insidious Chill got played, because now there's going to be two discard effects from this Aether Ice Vein. So since this has been, um, since he reveals an ice card for this, the Aether Ice Vein itself is going to have a discard effect, plus the Insidious Chill as well. So this is the turnaround turn from Rajan. This is the tempo seizing moment of the match. And look at that card that he's revealing. It's hypothermia. And oh, against... Big one, yeah. Absolutely. Think of it this way. I mean, um, you're just going to find the right time to play that. As soon as you see something like an embodiment of, uh, of lightning... You might just respond with the hypothermia to shut things down. Um, Majin Bay finding all the right uh, pieces here. I mean, this is a far cry from that Hayden Dale versus Isaac Crute match where, where it, it seems like I, Isaac Crute had like that dash ability, start the game with Channel Mount Heroic on the board. And that's kind of how that, uh, that, that game was dictated, was a Channel Mount Heroic for sticking around seemingly for the entire game. In this case, Isaac Crute is is finding out that, uh, you know, things kind of even out eventually as Majin Bay is just being very consistent with the pressure chipping away. Sure, the life totals are what they are, but ultimately here, it looks like Majin Bay is really just laying it on thick and finding the answers when they're presented. Yeah, it does look like some damage is going to get through. A whole bunch of resources are going to get spent to protect some of the cards. And I think the point you just made is like the most important point of this match so far is the fact that Channel Mount Heroic has not shown up yet for Isaac. And for anyone who's played against these Briar decks, or pretty much Briar at all, right now in CC, there's two different games that you play. There's the games where they have the early Channel Mount Heroic, and it stays around for multiple turns. And there's a game where they don't have the early Channel Mount Heroic, and the game looks more like this. The game's way more fair. It's way easier for you to usually navigate. But when they have the Channel Mount Heroic, if it sits around for two turns, generally your life total is a lot lower than your opponent's. Isaac Crude is going to go ahead and so tomorrow uh, from the arsenal that allows you to go ahead and find one of those uh, uh, elemental cards, if I'm not mistaken, that uh, that you've already tossed away. And if you don't have one, well, you don't have one. But uh, looks like that's uh, what's going to be peeled away. It doesn't look like he found something. I'll give you the exact text on that card. Again, that card being so tomorrow saying put target earth or elemental action card with cost two or greater from your graveyard on the bottom of your deck. Banish so tomorrow. If it's played from Arsenal, draw cards. So he's just looking through the deck, and I don't think there was anything really in there that he could have peeled away. But I think part of it is just again start the turn with a non-attack action, replenish the card you use to pay for it, and uh, that this this might be it, uh, Tannen. Oh no! Okay, I mean hey, a blue like, Earth I was, card. I was, I was waiting to find out. I was like. You almost timed it perfectly. You know, Kurt gave you the little, I think he balked a little bit on playing the card. He was like, uh, okay. Well, it's a belittle ultimately here, pitching the blue Autumn's Touch. Uh, so two floating, nothing shown. I don't think he, did he flash something there? Yeah, maybe the, you know, flash something that we couldn't see. Not exactly sure. It does look like maybe this is just an attack though. Yeah, that's a tough break here for Isaac Crude as uh, we're following up here with just a Rosetta Thorn, but the, Rosetta Thorn uh, is going to do two and two because of the So Tomorrow opening up that entire uh, exchange. So getting Rosetta value is part and parcel of what Rune Blades want to do. It's a reason why it's there's a reason why it's it's the 
in my opinion, the strongest weapon in the game. And uh, ultimately, you need the right recipe. And it's just not attack, attack with go again, and kaboom. Uh, Rosetta gets some work done. Speaking of getting work done and really strong things, here we have a channel like Frigid on Majin Bayside. Yet another card that's really getting its Isaac crew. You know, we talk about how resource hungry these Briar decks are now. Everything's going to cost extra mana. I'm sorry, extra resources for the uh, the Briar player. And there's going to be an activation of Coronet Peak here as well for Majin Bay. So not only taxing the cards in Isaac hand, but taxing the actual hand itself here as well. And you can see why it's so just like difficult, right? And annoying to play against Icelander right now because they're physically attacking you. They're, you know, sending arcane damage on your turn and their own turn. They're attacking you with Wounded Bull. They're taxing all of your stuff. They're giving your stuff. They're taking go away, away from, um, go again away from you. They're giving you Frostbites. I mean, th their range is infinite on every single turn and it's so hard. You know, you were talking about this, you know, you might not, the, the best players generally aren't caught unaware of what's going to happen, but you can't always know exactly what's going to happen. And I, I like this point that you made to me at one time where like, you should just assume you're going to get a frostbite every turn. You should just add one to a lot of your stuff. And I think that's one of the better ways to fight through this Icelander. Yeah, certainly. And uh, I mean, Channel Like Frigid is going to be probably the worst of your nightmares, for, especially for these go wide style decks. I mean, the only, I, I, in my opinion, I think the only other hero that would probably hate this more is Fi, but ultimately oh, yeah. uh, Channel Like Frigid is, is a powerhouse. It's such a workhorse of your 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 sort of your disruption arsenal and uh th oh boy that is a big attack here as runic reclamation is being presented by isaac crude and that has some implications as well because well uh if it hits destroy target aura and i'm pretty sure that that's an aura yeah and if you do you also get a rune chant token as well here so this is a really really big play from isaac crude here and look at the respect majin bay is giving this attack that is incredible. I mean, usually that is a last resort. You're going to toss the tunic in that into the ring when you know that you're never going to get value out of it. But runic Lork reclamation here from Isaac Crude, an unassuming turn in the face of a Channel Lake Frigid. But ultimately, look at the work it has done. I think Isaac Crude really got away with murder there. Yeah, I mean, attacking for seven, right? That's one hell of a break point. This means it's two cards plus something. And you can see why Manjin didn't want to give up another card from his hand. And he's like, look. I don't know how many more resources I can get off this tunic. Maybe one as the game goes on from here. So maybe just soaking up that one from that reclamation and not getting hit by it, not getting view the rune chant, not losing, you know, some of these important things is worth it enough for me to just give it up there. E strike, a very efficient card. It's very versatile as well. Uh, I'm not sure what mode uh, Majin has selected. I would suspect it's the plus two, uh, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, yeah, I oftentimes, don't know if there's any cards left over in his hands. I think it, I think you're right on the plus two. Yeah, the plus two seems like the right move here. Again, it's just uh, a, a versatile. I mean, you could you it could be a five with go again. It could be a five with a draw card, or it could be just a plus two attack. And in this case, Majin Bay presenting just you know you hit me with seven. Uh, your seven was pretty ugly, so I'm going to come back with my own seven. Not as devastating, not as scary, but Isaac Crude here is going to present the Crown of Providence, uh, one of the most, you know, sought after pieces, head pieces uh, that has come out of Uprising. I actually just finally got my my copy of it. I've been trying Where to get one been? for a long time. Well, I haven't been able to play a lot lately. I've been busy in the booth, so you know, I haven't really, you know, there's there's no pro quest season going on for me right now, so I haven't been playing as much. I just never got a copy of the card. So finally got my uh, mind to finish my generic equipment setup, but it does look like we're getting to that point of the game where the equipment's going to start coming out a little bit here. You know, players jockeying for position. They're both down to 20 here. You know, the person who gets the their opponent down to like 10, maybe single digits is going to be way ahead. So you're seeing the players kind of trying to get as much tempo here and not give up cards so they can pressure their opponents to be the first one to really give up short uh, this, footing here. This smells, this has an odor... Ten and Grace, oh, yeah. the red oh, yeah. snatch. You know, you know. There's some creepy little uh, little thoughts going through Isaac's mind right now. Yeah, it looks like this snatch coming in for three. It looks like it's going to get blocked out. But I wonder what's what's in behind this. You know, I wonder if we're going to have maybe an activation of something that you alluded to here. A certain pair of boots. Oh, you know, you get a little. You put your boots on. You can go out and do some things. Maybe Isaac it's a minnowism. Oh, here comes the boots. Yeah, it's creeper time. Isaac puts his boots on just like any other human being, <laughs> even though you and I both know that he's an actual machine. 
Yeah, except one of his feet is usually right up my ass because he just beat the crap out of me in a game. Uh, but he's going to sneak <laughs> in the Channel Mount Heroic. Why not? That's a nice one to throw out there. Yep, this is going to refresh. Uh, it's got to go again here as well. So it's going to refresh the action point. So we might not be done this turn as well. Now this does hit. So this is going to draw a card. Isaac showing you why a lot of people think that when it's used correctly, Spellwing Creepers might be one of the most, if not the the single most uh, powerful piece of equipment in the game. Yeah, you just got to understand it. Like, that's the first little order of business. Man, that Tales of Aria, the more you look back on it, the more of of a, a, just a, a beautiful set it was. It's still my favorite set of all time. Um, it, incredible cards, incredible artwork, the synergies involved in it, but man, the legendaries, the more you look at them. I thought New Horizon, to me, was like, you know, that's the, that's the pinnacle. That's the number one legendary that everyone is going to look for. Uh, you know, Ram's Head was in there as well. I thought Crown of Seeds was so so i thought it was pretty like you know paltry I, I, yeah. same spellbound creepers to me i just didn't want to read the card so i was like it's a one block in my mind it's iron rot boots it's all that's five all years, i care yeah five years from now we're gonna look back and be like this was the set like th this was the set the heroes were all absurd all the equipment was you know very nice uh the talents coming out of it are so impactful the set was so deep so rich it was the best limited format in my opinion as well can't talk enough about how much I love Tales of Aria. I don't know if we have enough time in the show to get through everything that I love about that and the love letter that I would write to Tales of Aria. Five years from now, it's going to be you and I, okay? We're going to be talking about Tarek Patel's fifth consecutive national title, right? Four different countries, probably. He's probably yeah. moved on to Europe at this point. He's like, I've, I've conquered <laughs> all of North America. i got to go over. I, I'm, I've conquered Westeros. i got to go over to the free lands across the narrow sea and go get the other... <laughs> He's like uniting more than seven kingdoms. Yeah, he's going to be out there in Mustafar, just like picking up the remnants of Anakin Skywalker, saying, are you the top top dog in this uh, in this place? Uh, you know, I feel like so. Game of Thrones is Star Wars, because you're getting all of it today. <laughs> we're getting everything. We haven't even discussed Middle Earth yet, but we're, 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 we're going to, because Channel Mount Heroic and Khazad Doom and Mount Doom sure. all are similar. But at this rate, it's, a, it's two rune chants. And that are being uh, presented right now as uh, Isaac Crute is just laying it on thick for Majin Bay, And Majin Bay has really been, in my opinion, one of the chief aggressors in this case. Uh, and even though the life total may not seem that way, he's been playing it masterfully, really dancing around uh, some of Isaac's uh, more potent uh, attacks. But uh, we're not done here. As Isaac Crute is presenting Blue Minnowism. Yeah, it, this is a really good point from you, Flake. This is uh, this is the impactful turn from Isaac. You know, we talked about Majin, you know, that Aether Ice Vein turn with the Insidious Shield. This is the real tempo seizing turn from him. And Isaac really, really, really needed a turn like this, where he pushes tons of damage and starts to put Majin in a really, really tough spot. Now, Majin does have three cards left and an arsenal after this, so that's coming out of this better than I thought he was going to be with this life total. Let's see what it's going to be at the very end. It looks like it's going to go down to 11. So it's a pretty low life total with this Channel Mount Heroic still going to be around. So you got to wonder, you know, if Majin's going to be able to have a big enough turn here to make Isaac give up some cards from his hand. Because like you said, this, this was so important for Isaac. This was the first turn where he really was like, I'm going to be in the driver's seat now. I'm turning this around. So we'll see just how deep did Majin bay dwell into the mountain let's see if he's got some really good old magic going on for him down there that he can use with his icelander oh boy well he's got to tread lightly because the balrog is uh, is awakening because that uh channel mount heroic will stick around majin bay presenting now scar for a scar isaac crude at 20 life can probably just digest a whole lot of this is the attacks that majin bay was presented there i mean you're at 11 health here I, I mean this is not a flintstone chewable at this point it's a pretty big pill to swallow for majin bay to be at 11 staring down a five card hand from isaac crute with channel mount heroic and a free go again to open things up so majin's got to make sure that he can perhaps maybe uh if his hand feels good and it seems like he likes it because he did not present any blocks he held on to three cards here if he likes his hand he might be able to put Isaac Crute in a situation where Isaac's going to take it as he does now. And then maybe Isaac Crute will get into a position where Majin with his uh, Storm Striders can really pop off here. And honestly, you know, I think you're 100% right. Now, this is a card that could be really impactful. This is a blue brain freeze. Now, this is going to have a discard effect for Isaac. Now, it's going to also get him to let him look at Isaac's hand. If there's something that costs zero in there, he's going to be able to take it from him. So here's another big kind of taxing effect thing that we're going to see not to mention that's an amulet of ice that's also been revealed for majin so a possible another discard effect that could happen if another uh, thing like this were you know it's layer upon layer upon layer of these discards like they come as one at first then they come as two 
and later and sometimes you can even have the ones where like the dreaded uh three effects of a turn and that can be game winning at a point because isaac's not gonna have enough cards left because see majin's worried about the multiple attack turns from isaac right now if he gets into the point where isaac has you know two cards in his hand and has to pay for an attack then he's okay with shrugging off one you know he could shrug off one attack for like six or seven he can't he can't do it if he's getting attacked for 12 or 15 which was gonna happen with this hand from isaac crew Getting rid of one of the Swarming Gloom Veils, another one in hand, Arcanic Crackle, and a Blue Autumn's Touch. So you got the fuel for the turn to potentially work your way through some of those ice, uh, those icicles, those frostbites that might be nipping at Isaac's toes. Uh, you've got the free go again, potentially from the Swarming Gloom Veil. Uh, actually, I don't even know if you'll get the free go again from the Swarming Gloom Veil, but he's going to go ahead and uh, Waning Moon as well. He got rid of the Arcanic Crackle. So... Isaac Krutz started this turn in such a healthy position, but Majin Bay is just peeling cards away, just shearing them away. Yeah, the again, the annoying thing that happens when you play against Icelander, like you're never knowing what's going to happen or when it's going to happen. And sometimes you're like, oh, my hand's great. Oh, boy, speaking of great hands, here comes a second channel mount heroic from Isaac Krutz. But that's his whole, that's the whole kit and caboodle, right? Like that's all of the gas. And depending on what Majin Bay here ha has here, he might be able to go ahead and flash some, um, some ice and really end the turn. But Majin is just sort of balking at this. And now what is this? Well, that is a, uh, what is that? Three, six. That is a nine point swarming gloom veil with go again. Yeah. So this is a huge attack. Let's see. This is, this is a really rough spot for Majin. How is he going to get out of this? If he can give a frostbite over to Isaac, he won't be able to swing the Rosetta after this as well. Cause he is representing a resource with his, uh, his tunic here. So that's something that could happen to finish this turn off as well. So that's another thing that needs to be in the back of Majin Bay's head here. It's not just this. It's not just this nine <laughs> flake, which is this is a huge attack, right? You know, we're seeing Kroot really exert his will here over these last two turns. And this is putting Majin in a tough spot. Let's see if, if he can dance around this enough. Well, if you can create a Frostbite here, you might be able to stifle a Rosetta Thorn as there's no more cards in Isaac's hand, but you do have the one floating, uh, the, the locked and loaded Tunic. But uh, it's going to cost you two in that case, so there's no point in doing it. Uh, but nine go again. If there's no frostbite presented, you can rest assured that Isaac's going to come back with a Rosetta Thorn. Really uh, put the screws to Majin Bay here. But don't forget, friends, this is a wizard. It's not your turn. It's our turn, Tannen. So, you know, he might have a little do -si do action that he can do. He might want to, you know, show off his dance moves on uh, when the spotlight's on Isaac. So he's considering a lot of things here. You know, like if I block, what happens? If, you know, hypothermia here is going to take away, go again. It's going to give a frostbite. It's going to stop Isaac's turn here. Also, I wonder if he's thinking about possibly bringing some of the equipment out to get a little bit of a block in here just to try to keep a couple cards in his hand to get Isaac down to a lower life total so that Isaac isn't just free to do whatever. Also, you know, it's not just going to be both of the channel mount heroics next turn as well. Only one of these is going to be around. It does look like fighting spirits are going to come out and block here, gain a life along a coronet peak. So this is going to actually give him quite a bit uh, a buffer here and soak up a lot of this damage and it's only going to bring him down to seven it could have been way worse this turn and there's going to be what i think three cards left over in majin's hand here so really good job by majin to make it out of this turn with as much resources left over and life points as well absolutely but he's got to start putting it back on uh, on isaac's side of the board here i mean you got to start returning these serves because frankly you still have another uh, another channel Mount Heroic. Uh, we, we talked about the the first round of this tournament. Isaac Kroot just seemingly had this endless supply of channel Mount Heroics. Now they've come, but they've come in bunches. And he had two on the board. Majin Bay did an excellent job of stopping it. And now he's coming back with Wounded Bull for eight. Yeah, and this one, um, you know, normally it's a three for seven, which is, you know, slightly above rate in, you know, especially for something out of like Icelander, right? But since he has a lower life total, his opponent it's going to gain plus one so it is attacking four eight here like flake said one of the main reasons to have this card in your deck you know you look at scar for scar it's just better when you have lower life levels findles fighting spirit so really leveraging the fact that the ice under hero starts at a lower life total than their than their opponents here almost always unless it's a mirror match of wizards and then you know there's a, it gives you that extra incentive like you want to play tempo in this matchup like you want to be able to take damage and then present some back and get kind of like you almost get to have two turns in a row, right? When you get to do stuff at, during your opponent's turn into your own turn, and then a little bit during their turn, a little bit, you know, you're constantly doing stuff. So taking a little extra damage here, it works out well in that strategy. And you see Michael Hamilton really figured out the way to kind of turn this on its head by playing just a few extra cards in his deck. 
that become better. You know, you look at Heart of Find Ill, this Fighting Spirit, Scar for Scar, Wounded Bull. These cards are just a little bit better when you're, quote unquote, losing Flake. Yeah, you, you just start losing. I mean, let's be real. Uh, let's. I showed up to high school on day one with a Star Wars shirt on. Uh, I so I. You weren't supposed to do that. I did that too. I not not in like 2000 or the year like 1998. I think when I when I got into high school, 97 or 98. Yeah, uh, it, it wasn't cool that, right? back You're then. A little younger than I am. I think 99 was my first year of high school. I graduated in 03, I believe. Yeah, so I uh, I graduate I graduated in 03, but we have different. So Quebec, uh, you go to sure. grade what like 12 or 13 or something like that. Something like that. Yeah, sure. Yeah, either way, we, it's it, at the end of the day, uh, we American, grew up we in not account. We don't use the right system. I don't even know metric yeah. system. What does that even mean? Yeah. Yeah, Iron Iron Man hadn't come out yet in the MCU, so liking comic sure. books and Star Wars wasn't cool. Surprise, surprise! But here we are, just loving that stuff right now. And um, like He's you laughing said, now, all right, yeah, all right, have, like nine to fives, and you and I get to talk about children's card games for a living. Oh, and doing it with like you know this level of production, this this quality and caliber of player, I love it. I love it. Look, I'm tearing up. I'm actually I'm tearing up thinking about it. So. At the end of the day, um, Majin Bay here presenting Wounded Bull for eight. Uh, Isaac Kurt's going to go ahead and float a, a resource here. He's going to throw the throw the the whole closet at it, and you know, it's all I got left is this is it. It's my party robe, and it's yours and this Arcana Crackle. And apparently, we're also going to go ahead and use that uh, that Oasis respite. Now, uh, you got two cards out of the hand here. Majin Bay may have presented the right recipe here to really stifle what Isaac Crute was hoping to clap back with, which was that uh, another Channel Mount Heroic turn, but it's looking like it's not going to be that potent. Yeah, unfortunate for Isaac, you know, his draw didn't match up well with leaving this Channel Mount Heroic left over. Get, you know, drawing Oasis Respite, yeah, it's great in this matchup, but not something that you want to draw on the turns where you're going into your Channel Mount Heroic turn, right? Like, you just want all the freebies, you want all the goodies, all the things that cost zero. You can just throw at your opponent and be like, well, I'm just going to attack you for a solid 18, you know, 24 this turn. We saw a 40 attack turn from Kroot in this in this event as well. What an absolute legend, this guy. So, and, yeah, uh, very good. He'll point. never tell you, though. He'll never tell yeah, you. No. The kid does not like to talk. Thankfully, we have people like you and I around that can fill up all the dead air because we just never stop. But oh, oh, we just have these huge attacks here from uh, Rising. <laughs> That's another big one, and again on hit, I think that's just going to go ahead and take out the. Uh, does that take out the Insidious Chill? I think if it if it does hit, it gets some work done as well. Insidious Chill is in fact an aura. No, it's not. No, it's. I'm looking at Ice Eternal. Insidious Chill it aura, is perfect. Yeah. And so this is an attack for ten, so very likely to hit in some way, shape, or form, unless Majin wants to give up his entire hand. Though, I wonder how much he's valuing the last the last counter on the Insidious Chill, or if he's going to you know use it here, but. No cards left in Isaac's hand. Uh, the, the last counter, not really important this turn. So, well, see, this this is a precarious spot. Is you know this is a lot like last turn. Machin has to figure out how to navigate this with cards left over his hand, so that he could still present some lethal. You don't you don't want to be like set up in the abyss here, where you're just giving your whole hand every turn to crew. So, yeah, he's he's look at that. Yeah. The whole the whole the whole package here is getting blocked here, and maybe Machin Bay is thinking, all right, well. I can I can take a turn off because I can play on my opponent's turn. Uh, so let's no equipment left for Isaac. He is butt naked and scared at this rate. And uh, <laughs> and and <laughs> Isaac Crude here also no more Channel Mount Heroic, no Arsenal. So he is honestly just naked and afraid against a wizard that is going to bring not the heat, but the cold. I, I think you just made the perfect point there. We're we're going to turn from Isaac. If you if you can survive from there, and this is why Majin, you know, you, you've seen him identify the turns that he should be defensive, like how early, you know, he brought out a tunic of the block this turn, and then the last turn, you know, giving up four cards from his hand here because Isaac's, like you said, he's naked. He has no more armor left. He's not gonna have the channel mount heroic left. So what he gets in his hand is all he gets to play with now. He doesn't have any more of the big power cards or the armor to help out here. So Majin's like, look, I'm just gonna weather this storm here this turn. See what happens next turn. Maybe stop a little bit, though. Force Major is something that can get stuff going. Um, but he's going to try to turn the game on its head here this turn by just surviving through that super good last couple turns from Isaac Crute. 
Storm Strider is looming large and uh, pressing on uh, Isaac Kurt's mind, and there they go. Snap those bad boys. It's putting on his dancing shoes. Majin Bay is going to be playing at instant speed. Again, this is all off of the back of a Force of Nature fuse. Isaac Kurt is a passenger now to see just how far this can go as a red Aether Ice Vein is presented with a fusion. So Isaac Kurt under the gun. Yeah, this is an unbelievable turn for Majin's going to give. This, I would say, this is going to give multiple discard effects over to Isaac Kurt here. And this is in response to a force of nature. So this is horrible timing for Isaac Kurt. This is going to be devastating and getting multiple cards out of his hand or multiple resources from him. And there's already a blue being played. It looks like he's going to just take the damage from the Aether Ice Vein. Oh, that's a okay. yellow. Sorry, I believe that's a yellow. Okay. So it does look like it's a yellow. He's going to pitch here to pay for uh, two, to pay for one of the discards. Nothing stopping here. Majin Bay knows that he's got a clean lane here, if necessary, with pure arcane damage to bring Isaac Kroot to his knees as there's really nothing left. Isaac Kroot, like we said, naked and afraid out there. No arsenal. Presenting a fused force of nature, but uh, in response, Majin Bay breaking the Storm Striders, presenting a fused yellow Aether Ice Vein, peeling cards away from Isaac Kroot's hand with the Insidious Chill in check as well. Majin Bay uh, is, is really just laying it on thick here in response to the first non-attack action that Isaac Crude has presented. Again, keep in mind, this is this is Isaac's turn. Majin Bay playing with house money on this one, saying, screw it. I don't care whose turn it is. I've got some stuff to do. Yeah, this is one of the reasons why a lot of people on the Icelander side think they have a decent matchup into Briar. It's because of stuff like this. You know, we mentioned earlier, um, when their Embodiment of Earth pops, it gives you a priority spell uh, stop. A lot of the times they start their turns out with something like you know, Belittle, which is a smaller attack, or they play Channel Mount Heroic, or they start off with a Garganian Tome or an Earth Lore Surge, something along those lines. And then you could be like, okay, well, in response, I'm going to give you a Frostbite, and I'm going to stop some of the cards from your hand. And you're seeing Majin really take advantage of that timing. And not only is he going to be able to block out here, but he's got those resources floating over to get three more damage in as well with that Waning Moon activation. But we are going to be going back over to Isaac with, I think, no arsenal for Majin Bay. So Isaac may be looking to get something here, but that was the turn for Majin that's kind of turning this game back to being a little more fair and into his side. And this is where things can get really nasty for the... Um for for the uh, briar player now you're opening up here with a red bramble spark fused that's a great great start to the turn but if the rest of your hand is pretty unassuming well then that's just briar things again we've seen briar uh reach the pinnacle in the top of the mountain going absolute ape with the amount of damage and attack and stuff that they can do but we've also seen them fall flat when you draw you know four non-attacks or four attacks with no go against but we're starting with a bramble spark into a yellow belittle uh and that is going to be we're not flashing anything for this one it's going to be uh, still coming in for five with one Arcane at Majin Bay. And Majin Bay does have Arcane Barrier. The question is, is it worth a card to give up here? Yeah, coming in for that extra damage because the Bramble Spark did have Earth Fusion here. So that plus three is going to be applied onto the Belittle. So this is a very large amount of the remaining life total for Majin. He's in a rough spot here because he's got to figure out, what can I block with? to survive and still do some stuff on my next turn or just set up an arsenal as well. He wants to try to maybe leave himself left over with a blue here. And so he's still thinking about that arcane as well, that arcane damage. Do, does he want to float in here? Because what if uh, the Rosetta Thorn comes in behind this? So if he uses, you know, say a resource to stop this arcane, there might be more later in the turn that he can, you know, use the floating resources to stop from there. So we'll see. But it looks like he is just going to receive that one arcane. And now he's thinking about the physical damage from the belittle. Here's what Majin Bay needs to do here. What he needs to do is obviously stay alive, first and foremost, for sure. Sure, yeah, that's he important. Needs to, he needs to get the hell out of this turn with a blue uh, a blue ice card in Arsenal. Because Isaac Kruta 7 is susceptible to so much nasty damage. And um, was that from Arsenal? That's oh, no, from... that's just a block. That's just blocking, my bad. So Hypothermia presenting, uh, representing uh, just two. But uh, that's what you get typically from non-attack actions. It's just a little two block. Yep, three leaking over so far. Majin's still contemplating. He wants to be this the only block he's got left. Three cards left in his hand, so maybe. But it does look like he's going to let that three leak over. Down to three here. In a rough spot, here comes the Rosetta Thorn. Like in terms of big, uh, sorry, big defenses, 
Majin Bay is running three Brothers in Arms. There's no defense reaction. So if you're looking for the big value blocks, I mean, Brothers in Arms uh, is all you're going to get here. But two and two off Rosetta Thorn. Uh, all the, the, the check mark boxes were, were ticked there as you have not attack attack with go again. And here comes a Rosetta for two and two Majin Bay at three. Isaac taking a look at his, uh, as graveyard doing a little accounting there to make sure what's going on here. But ultimately Majin Bay uh, under the gun here at three and uh, just trying to survive with an arsenal. So maybe he can do a little theatrics on Isaac's follow-up turn. And yeah, this is a big part of the part of the game. When you, whenever you see Majin make this question, ask this question, like, let me see your, I think he was looking for Oasis respite in Isaac Kurt's uh, graveyard. They're like, how many of them do you have? Because what Majin's thinking here, he's not just thinking about how to survive. He's not thinking about how to not die. He's thinking about how to win from this point. So I think what he's trying to do is he's trying to he's trying to find the right line here that keeps him alive, but also gives him the best chance to win from here. And I think he's trying to set up a do something on your turn out of my arsenal. Like you were saying, you know, let's get a blue ice card marshal or whatever. Anything that's good from here. Set up something that gets maybe some damage or stops you a little bit the next turn. I can maybe block with it and then win on my own turn. Storm Striders not being available anymore is big here for Isaac. It makes it a little bit easier for him to navigate. He He doesn't have to worry about dying at instant speed from something here uh, from Majin. Look at Majin's going to go ahead and just go all the way down to one here. After taking Majin, the two arcane. Yeah, and like we mentioned uh, in other matches, no coward. Uh, one infinitely times greater than zero. So it's all you need. You just need a buck in your back pocket. That's all you need to ride the bus, friend, all the way to victory land. And Majin Bay here is uh, going to play at one dangerous spot to be in because one Rosetta swing and it's all over, but he's playing the hypothermia and pocketing a card. So no go agains can be generated on Isaac Crute's side. The question is, is what kind of, you know, what kind of follow-up can you potentially make here in order to seal the deal? Because one swing of Rosetta will end the game. The question is, does Majin Bay have the right recipe in his arsenal here to, you know, convert on this? Yeah, the thing is, like, he's not actually going to be able to activate Rosetta Thorn and attack this turn, right? Because his attacks can't gain uh, go again. So, as we say, is he able to be able to play a non-attack action into an attack action into the Rosetta Thorn uh, this turn because of the hypothermia being in play on Isaac Kroot's side? As we say, this, this makes it very difficult for him to be able to force through arcane damage this turn. And also, I mean, Isaac's got to worry a little bit about dying in response to something here. If he, like, say, plays two or three cards from his hand, if Majin has a damage source, like, say, Aether, like a blue Aether Ice Vein from his arsenal, that's three plus three from the winning. I mean, that's only six, though. But he does have the Metacarpus nodes. I mean, I mean, sorry. Let's see. Can he actually kill him from here? Well, I mean, if there's any one player who knows the reach of... Icelander without Storm Striders or Nodes. It is Isaac Crude. Isaac Crude is arguably one of the best Icelander limited players in the world. Uh, it's something that uh, people, you know, I've I've practiced against him many yeah. times. I've played against yeah. him in limited on Icelander many times, and so, he's never out here. But we're opening up here with Emeritus this, scolding. Yeah, this is going to end the game, right? If if Isaac can't, he has no way to arcane barry here. So the Motor Scolding, since it's on his opponent's turn, is going to go for four. It's pumped to five for the Metacarpus Notes, plus the Waning Moon for another three. This is enough to kill Isaac Kurt. Then without uh, any of the AB, I mean, this looks like it's all done. Emeritus Scolding played on the opposite turn, does four, and Waning Moon does three. The Nodes, just in case, adding an L a little insult to injury. Isaac Kurt goes down to zero off the back of a Waning Moon and an Emeritus Scolding. That's enough. That's all she wrote for this matchup. Isaac Kurt did not necessarily get to scale the Channel Mount Heroic. Uh, to victory this time, but he did get a good view of what a great Icelander player looks like. Oh, absolutely. You know, you can't say enough about how good Majin play has played in this tournament. Same thing with Isaac Kurt, right? Nothing to, you know, shake his fist at. He played amazing this round, just it didn't line up. You know, the early Channel Mount Heroics, you mentioned this, so important, so impactful to have early in the game, wasn't found early enough for him. I do want to point out a few plays that happened early in the games, though. You know, we saw these opponents, we saw these both these players play well, but that Tunic give up from Majin Bay very early in the game seemed super impactful like the game probably went maybe more turns than he thought it would after that he would have gotten multiple resources from the tunic but blocking out that seventh power that turn in that runic reclamation and keeping around one of his extra auras the turn I can't remember exactly which one it was but that was super impactful for him to be able to you know trade two cards plus his tunic perfectly block out there and just stop Isaac just enough to give him enough time to set everything up play the game out and win from there 
I played against a ninja player at a uh, Battle Hardened once. Uh, I was on Prism, they were on Ninja. I got to go first, and they uh, their first block was Mask of Momentum on turn zero. And I was like, okay, um, it seems like easy straight from here on out. Very good player. Uh, ultimately, however, you know, those kinds of dedicating of your, your, your very high value equipment, uh, it has to be timed correctly. And it looks like Majin Bay did it the right way. Runic Reclamation has been a terror against uh, these decks like Icelander, and uh, you need to block it out, and you need to maintain the cards. And when that's the case, it's one of those stories of, yeah, this is cool, but if I don't make it to tomorrow, then what's the point of even having it, right? So right. Um, very good decisions on uh, on Majin Bay's side of the board there. Yeah, that means that he's going to be moving on to the semifinals as well. One win away from getting that coveted spot in that finals, the very first Goliath Gauntlet, and maybe crowning himself the very first Goliath Gauntlet champion ever. You know, that's going to be a nice little feather in someone's in someone's cap from this tournament. If you're the first person to ever win the Goliath Gauntlet, I mean, this tournament is stacked. The bragging rights alone are probably worth more than the money and whatever um, prizes we might have added in here towards the end. Yeah, there's a little little something something that uh, you never know. Again, uh, as it's in, the, this, it's in the mail, Flake. It's in the mail. It's absolutely. It's in the post for all you Europeans. So, uh, friends, that wraps up today's action. Again, some spicy Wednesday. Just kind of you know throw it in there because we like you so much. Uh, don't forget to join us back here at the Goliath Gauntlet at 93 Media for more flesh and blood of the, the 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 clash of these titans has been so exciting. More Goliath Gauntlet action coming to you on Friday.